people are joining us, I would like you to uh, I would like to draw your attention to the rules of engagement that are beautifully summed up uh, on this slide. So while others, and we are very used to this by now, while others are speaking, please mute yourself. Uh, please keep your camera on during the meeting um, so we can see you. But of course, if you have something to do, you can switch it off. Please use the name you have registered with for this event so we know who we are, we, you are. And please use the chat. That's a very important um, thing because we have a lot of participants today and we're very happy about that. But please use the chat to ask a question or make a comment. And Serena Rosadini from Serim will summarize the questions when we open the debate. So it's also very important that you keep your contributions short and concise. We will record the conference with the exception of the discussion, obviously, in the breakout rooms. And we have a fantastic Campus Brussels team uh, who is the host, and you can contact them if you have any technical queries. Unfortunately, you cannot ask them for coffee due to the circumstances that we're in. We would normally, of course, serve that. So I'm already um, kicking off without having been given any cues to do so, but I just abuse my power um, as host and as um, kicking off this conference. So I have not introduced myself and I will now formally open this conference, this kickoff conference of the Relay Project. I am Christine Neuhold. Some of you know me, some of you I have worked together with, and I'm very, very happy uh, to see so many people around the screens. I am professor of EU democratic governance. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, and I've been director of the campus. And in this function, we put forward this relay project together with the fantastic Campus Brussels team and many stakeholders around the screens today. And I'm still chairing the board of UM Campus Brussels. I will, in the next 10 minutes or so, do three things. First of all, welcome you, say something about the Relay project, and then immediately go into media's race and kick off the first panel. So first of all, Relay, what does it stand for? If you look around, all EU projects have an acronym and all EU projects um, have creative acronyms. And so our acronym stands for spreading and relating EU affairs beyond the EU institutions. And so we have picked letters from these words to make up Relay. We have set ourselves very high objectives to make the process of EU integration more tangible and more to more closely involve citizens, both when it comes to the internal and external dimension of the European Union. Relay, it's already in the name. We want to relay EU affairs to a broad array of stakeholders. And many stakeholders have already been involved in the setup of the project. And I really want to thank all of you for this, I'm going to just name some of them. The Brexit Institute at Dublin City University, the NGO Kieron Open Higher Education, the Young European Federalists, the Charlemagne Prize Academy, and the European Universities Alliance of the Young Universities for the Future of Europe, that is known as UFE. What all these organizations have in common is the fact that they have engagement with EU affairs, and that's what we're doing today, and dialogue with stakeholders and citizens within their DNA. We said we want to spread EU affairs, but what are those? We were very happy that the commission at the time that we put forward our project, put forward its priorities. And we thought these priorities of the commission, of the political guidelines are perfect for our project as a kind of trampoline. So on the one hand, um, the European Green, Green Deal, an economy, an economy that works for Europe, a Europe that is fit for the digital age, 
promoting our way of life, European way of life, um, a stronger Europe in the world and a new push for European democracy. These priorities come back today, but they're also the key framework for our project. We will come back, and that's really important, to these issues in dedicated workshops. Today is just an appetizer. But of course, and we see this here today, but of course, since these priorities were drafted and we put in our relay project, the pandemic hit. And this led to new realities and new challenges. We will reflect to some extent on this during the conference, but also have a dedicated panel at the end. Let me still say something about the people around the screens, you. You are stakeholders, you are engaged in EU affairs, but we also want to use the opportunity of this project to engage with citizens in the wider sense of the term. So we also uh, pay special attention uh, to this, spreading EU affairs to those that are not in contact with the European Union on a regular basis. So I have now tried to say something about the Relay project, and I look to a campus Brussels headquarters. Have I forgotten anything? No, that was a very good summary. Thank you, Christine. Okay. <laughs> good. So we'll try to keep it uh, interactive, and I have not pre-discussed this with the team. So uh, thanks so much for being so flexible. So now, um, I would like to open, so I'm putting on a different hat. I would like to open the first panel and I'm chairing this first panel, which is a great honor. We have wonderful speakers around the screens. Um, and the first panel is dedicated to a very large, ambitious topic, which links in with the commission priorities, making the European Union more democratic and more socially fair challenges ahead. And challenges ahead, indeed, we have. I have been said, asked to say a few words about the Commission priorities when it comes to this, when it comes to making the EU more democratic and more socially fair. When it comes to providing a new push for European democracy, a key focus in the Commission's priorities is, of course, the Conference on the Future of Europe that is to run for two years. The conference is to bring together citizens, including a significant role for young people, civil society and European institutions as equal partners. It is to make the EU more tangible and also more relevant also for young people. The Commission President has made clear that this exercise would explore institutional changes including, and now I become very technical, and that's one of the issues with the EU democratic system, that we have a lot of technicalities that are difficult uh, to relay. So one of the um, institutional changes is the Spitzenkandidaten system, the lead candidate system for choosing a commission president. Another priority is establishing real transnational lists of members of the European Parliament and nice not to crack, reforming council decision-making. Both the European Parliament and the Commission have put forward a position in the meantime. If you look at the political and academic and stakeholder commentary, the European Parliament's position is seen as more ambitious and also methodologically more concrete than that of the Commission, but both institutions seem to leave many questions open or are not exactly on the same page. One of these is whether the proposals of the conference will actually be followed up by treaty change or not. Whereas the European Parliament wants to leave open this possibility of treaty change, the council that put forward its position after the others wants to prevent this. And the commission is, as supposed to be, presenting itself as an honest broker in a middle position between the Council and the European Parliament. Speaking of Commission, 
The Commission is presenting, and thank you, Felix, for letting me know, is presenting its European Democracy Action Plan today. And that's very much linked, of course, to current events. The Commission reminds us that promoting free and fair elections and strong democratic participation are key. Countering disinformation is also one of these things that have to be tackled in earnest. And the Commission also reminds us that rule of law and fundamental rights are the foundations on which our European Union is based. Democracy is a core European value. So that's beautiful. That really uh, also puts our conference and our first panel in the spotlight. The conference on the future of Europe, so I'm now returning to the part of, uh, point of departure, the conference on the future of Europe was supposed to kick off on Europe Day on the 9th of May, but it is now delayed. It was difficult to get the conference started because of the pandemic. We can recognize that, of course. Many of our projects have been delayed because of the pandemic. And another thing that was at play, and we also recognize that when we follow EU affairs closely, is that there was a battle over who should preside over the conference. Um, so formally, we are now waiting for a joint declaration from the three main institutions to actually launch the conference. I'm happy to hear from our speakers and from our audience how they see the remit of the conference and also how they see the role that this delayed start might play. When it comes to making the EU more socially fair, the Commission President states that it's high time that we reconcile the social and the market in today's modern economy. And if you look at the proposals, they're very far reaching. On the one hand, um, or rather ambitious, let's put it this way, a legal instrument is supposed to ensure that every worker in the EU has a fair and minimum wage. A European unemployment benefit reinsurance system is to be introduced. And then we also have usual suspects such as combating tax fraud. But as I said before, and we're of course all very aware of this, is that the political and social landscape has really changed since the pandemic hit. And we also all know that the EU has adopted an unprecedented recovery plan, but that recovery plan is now also open to political squabbles. It is threatened by veto of some member states. And we will discuss that also in the first uh, panel. I would now, and I look at my clock and I'm actually, I think really on time. I would now like to open the floor to our speakers for a pre brief view on how you see what I just sketched, the efforts of the EU in making the uh, EU more democratic and more socially fair. Of course, you can make links between both issues and you can also pick and choose, but please, um, pay attention to the time. Please take three minutes max to kick off the debate. And I will then come back to each speaker with a dedicated question. So I will first introduce our speakers very briefly and then give them the floor in the order of my introduction. So we have Ian Cooper, with whom I have worked extensively, um, who is a research a fellow at the Brexit Institute at Dublin City University. We have Alberto Alemano, Jean Monnet Professor in European Union Law and Policy at the HEC Paris and Director of the Good Lobby. We have Victor Texera, who is an Advocacy Officer on EU Integrity, Transparency International EU, welcome. We have Bernard Rebert, who is the research director of the National Center for Scientific Research and Political Research Center of Sciences Po Paris. And we have Sophie Bonschlegel, who is a fellow of the Charles Price Academy, who is one of our partners and also has a second hat. She's senior policy and analyst at the European Policy Center. So you can see that we have a beautiful panel that can approach this topic from different angles. So without further ado, I give the screen to Ian Cooper. Thank you, Christine. 
Um, can you hear me? Great. Um, the I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, as a way to lead in to talk about the conference on the future of Europe. Um, what I would suggest is that one item on the agenda for the, that conference should be thinking about creative ways of involving national parliaments more in the work of the European Union. Now, as we as we recall, uh, Valérie Giscard d'Estaing died this week, and he was, of course, the uh, the president of the European Convention, which met uh, 17 years ago, um, and and that was the last time we had an exercise like this. Um, Giscard was in favor of uh, more involvement of national parliamentarians. He actually proposed an idea of a congress of, uh, that would meet regularly, uh, that would be made of, of, of ME, M, MEPs and MPs. Uh, now, not, that didn't come to be, but the European Convention um, did devise a, a, a mechanism to involve national parliaments in the work of the EU, and that is the subsidiarity uh, early warning mechanism. Um, now, and I bring that up um, not because I want to talk specifically about that mechanism, but it is it shows that that was a creative solution to a problem that grew out of the convention itself. So it was not part of the convention's mandate. The convention had a general mandate to try and uh, bring a greater uh, focus on subsidiarity and a greater role for national parliaments. And those two streams, those two uh, working groups, the work of those two working groups were combined um, in a creative way within the convention. They came up with this subsidiarity early warning mechanism um, uh, as a way to kind of give national parliaments greater say and also have uh, more subsidiarity control. Um, and so, and that, of course, ended up in the convention. And finally, in the strength informed, it ended up in the Lisbon Treaty. Um, now, we can debate about whether or not that was effective. But I think that, uh, that, a similar, that similarly, the Conference on the Future of Europe could take a creative approach to thinking about national parliaments. And of course, the, in the convention, um, there was the majority of the members of the convention were members of national parliaments. And at the meeting of COSAC this week, <clears throat> um, a number of uh, members of COSAC, which is the six, meeting every, every uh, six months of uh, the European Affairs Committees and the national parliaments, and uh, many voices there were saying that, that MPs, members of national parliaments, need to be deeply involved in the conference on the future of Europe. And I agree with that. Um, and if you look at the way and so if I wanted, wanted to make one kind of general kind of institutional point, um, if you look uh, at, at the time of Lisbon, uh, there was just one interparliamentary conference in the EU, one general interparliamentary conference that meets every six months, and that was COSAC. And, but now there are four. Um, as the and one on uh, common foreign and security policy, one on economic governance, and one on Europol the Joint Parliamentary Scrutiny Group of Europol. Um, so there's been a huge expansion in the, num in the kind of interparliamentary conferences, interparliamentary meetings and coordination, um, but it's been rather disjointed. So uh, if I had to make a single kind of uh, proposal, I would say there needs to be some thought given on how to kind of uh, coordinate the work of all the of, of all the national parliaments. Uh, the national parliaments work at the EU level. Um, and so, and I think that they have a role in communicating, they have a relay role um, in communicating the EU back to the citizens through the, through the national parliaments, which are you know, at the heart of the national democracy in each, uh, in each member state. Um, but I think that they also have, an, they are developing an oversight role with respect to EU institutions. And, that, and the Europol group is a good example of that. It's called the Europol Joint Parliamentary Scrutiny Group. So they actually, it's, it's a group that actually has a formal scrutiny role in relation to an EU agency. And that's something genuinely new. And, and uh, but if I had to make one suggestion that there should be a secretariat, 
uh, that is a general secretariat for national parliaments in the European Union uh, that could build on the existing COSAC secretariat, build on the existing network of national parliamentary representatives in Brussels. Um, and uh, that, could, that could have the effect of, uh, of streamlining uh, this, what is, what is now rather disjointed um, uh, function of national parliament's uh, involvement in the European Union at the EU level. Thank you so much, Ian, for um, making the link between um, the past and the present, and also um, coming up with very um, concrete suggestions of what um, should be dealt with. Uh, and of course, it's no coincidence that you talk about national parliaments, because that's also your really, um, you know, you're one of the key scholars in the field. And so you. speaking of key, uh, key scholars in the field, I merge it to the word fellows, but um, I would like to give the floor to Alberto Alemano. Thank you, Christine. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to see you all. Uh, as you know, I'm a big fan of relaying the EU uh, to citizens and to civil society. I'm a big fan of the uh, Maastricht Brussels campus. Um, let me say by um, sharing with you a sentiment of déjà vu uh, when discussing about the role of citizens in our union. The terms of the debate uh, of today are not dissimilar from those that characterize the end of the 90s, early 2000s, the white paper on governance that we have been studying so much. This idea that we need to democratize the democracy of the European Union is back at the center of the political discourse. Um, however, the learnings uh, from that experience, which has not been very successful because it's basically what led the conventional, the, the treaty, uh, the, con the, the convention that was supposed to write a treaty and the treaty to somehow uh, constitutionalize uh, our European integration process didn't lead to a very successful result. And this is one of the democratic scene uh, of, of Europe. And uh, at the same time, when you look at what happens today, well, 20 years have passed by and the lack of learnings is clearly showing the inherent limitations, both in terms of mission and in terms of methodology of the Conference on the Future of Europe, which is imminent, uh, which suggests that it's going to be yet another top-down, at least in terms of design exercise imposed by the institutions of people, when in reality there could have been the opportunity to involve civil society and citizen movements and citizens themselves in co-designing this participatory exercise. What an incredible paradox. The largest self-proclaimed uh, public participation process ever has not involved citizens in the co-design of this process. So in a way, we're going to start again from that original scene and we're going to perpetuating that model. Uh, but in the meantime, time has passed. European integration has, in one way or, in a way or another, evolved with other major flaws. But what we can see, in particular, through the prism of COVID, is a gap which is emerging, which is expanding between the uh, European Union as a space which is socioeconomically interdependent. COVID showed that. But at the same time, a set of institutional mechanisms which is very insulated from uh, citizen input, and in particular, which responds to a logic which is still the logic of the nation state. That gap, uh, I would say, is getting more visible and shows that today the problem we face is not necessarily a problem of democratic deficit, but is a problem of democratic intelligibility. We don't understand how decisions are taken in Brussels and how the national political discourse is shaping the Brussels conversation. We don't know how our national political parties act within the European Parliament because there's no visibility of that. When you look at the constitutional framework, what we have learned and what happened over the last 20 years has been something quite unique in the world. The fact that the source of legitimacy for European action is not only derived from representative democracy and directly through our government sitting in the council or directly through our members of the European Parliament we elect, 
but also through participatory democracy. This is enshrined in the treaty. And although the role that participatory democracy is less important than the representative one, still is there. It is constitutionalized. So what I would like to talk about is the state of play of participatory democracy, how the European Union has been operationalizing such a commitment to make participation one of the legitimating factors of European action. This has translated into the creation of a panoply of channels of participation that range from public consultation uh, to petitions to the European Parliament's complaints to the European Ombudsman, the European citizen initiatives, the uh, refeed platforms. These are all channels that allow citizens to have a say and to influence the policy process. However, when you look at the state of play empirically, you see that the number of actors who seem to be aware of those instruments remain very limited. And in particular, the use which is made of those instruments seem to be very instrumental to advance a limited number of interests. So my big research question at the moment is how Europe would look like if Europeans would be using more often those instruments, how their inputs from the bottom up would be shaping the political conversation and the policy process. This is a missing point in our constitutional uh, structure. When and how the participatory input, let's say an ECI and the day-to-day -day decision making do meet together. Participatory democracy and representative democracy are like ships passing at night. They don't meet one another. You can be successful in an ECI, you collect one million signature, you're gonna show up in front of the European Parliament under the new regulation, but still there's no institutional mechanism obliging, forcing, the decision makers in the day to day it could be a comitology process, it could be uh, the regular policy process that oblige them to somehow take into account and be responsive to the public input. This exists all across the avenues of participation I've been giving to you. This is a sort of black box that is still at the center of the conversation that we should have. I don't expect the Conference on the Future of Europe to crack that knot. I think uh, the conference uh, at the moment is once again uh, very much driven by the member states. The fact that the major co conversation we are having is how to elect and who should be sharing this conference cannot really uh, give us a lot of hope. However, let's give it a chance to the Conference on the Future of Europe by saying that what this conference should be able to do is to mobilize the civil society organization, the citizens' input, in order to create new mechanisms that allow this participatory input and representation to work together beyond the conference. So the legacy of the conference, I'm coming to an end, should be to create a model, a method that will go beyond uh, the conference itself. Unless the conference will be able to deliver on such a new methods of participation and co-design of the policy process in Europe, the conference won't necessarily go, into, uh, go down into history as something that had an impact. Thank you so much, uh, Alberto, for um, yeah, shedding uh, the, the light on, on the challenges and also giving us a rather skeptical view, but still ending on a note of hope. I will now give the screen to uh, Vitor. And I think you have a similar angle in the sense that you also work um, for Transparency International and that you also deal with these issues um, on a daily basis. So the screen is yours. Good morning, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, well, first I want to say it's a pleasure to speak for uh, in this event from Maastricht University as it was there that I took my bachelor degree many, many years ago. Um, I, I have to start a bit by apologizing because I, have, I feel that I'm gonna throw a wrench into the conference as well. So, I mean, we are encouraged that to see some of the priorities of the commission president for the Alliance um, relates to political integrity. I mean, going beyond the conference, the, the attempt to create a mandatory lobby register, which was an issue that was um, being discussed for almost half a decade, that was completely stalled. And there were a lot of doubts whether the new commission would take it on board. Um, and the uh, second example would be the creation of an independent ethics body between the all EU institutions. So 
um, a body that would be responsible for looking at conflicts of interests of uh, policymakers, of uh, of uh, actually checking their their financial interests and so on. And I think this is very important because the EU has seen its share of scandals in the past. Um, and if these would become a reality, it would be a major step in ensuring a greater political accountability. But but to say that we are encouraged it's uh, and hopeful, it also at the same time, we acknowledge that reality is sometimes different. So what we plan in the beginning and what we come out at the end, sometimes or many times is quite different. So only time will tell. But uh, I think one thing is clear is that uh, we can speak of a conference and we're talking about uh, whether national parliaments should have a bigger say in the European Union or not. Uh, but let's keep in mind that the members of the European Parliament are democratically elected. And uh, I, I believe perhaps that um, the conversation, whether it is on the conference or not, uh, will only lead to a more politically fair Europe, as you were mentioning, if, uh, as it was already mentioned, to, to a degree is one, if citizens are able to see and understand what on earth is happening in Brussels. And I can tell you as a lobbyist myself, working every day influencing or trying to influence the, the EU institutions, that uh, it's very difficult for a normal person, normal citizen, even for a professional lobbyist to often understand what is, what exactly is happening as a whole in a legislative process. Uh, because if they're not able to see and if they're not able to understand, they cannot hold their representatives to account, whether those representatives come from a national parliament or from a European parliament or are representing the commission. Um, and um, we, and number two, we would have to ensure that those people making the taking the decisions do not have any conflict of interest between their public office and their private interests. And again, we talk about uh, parliaments, uh, national parliaments versus the European Parliament, but the truth is that throughout Europe. Uh, the mechanisms ensuring that there's no conflict of interest by policymakers are very weak. Um, and in, in that sense, the, the, the EU uh, stands um, head and shoulders above many other European parliaments, uh, m many other national parliaments. So I, I would say to sum up my, my introduction is that whether this conference will lead to a change or not, we need to make sure that whatever comes comes out of it, that people will, will be able to understand what their representatives are doing and be sure that the people that are taking the decisions don't have a personal stake in the decisions that they're taking. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for also reminding us how complex uh, the system is and also that this complexity should not be an outcome of the conference itself because then it obfuscates accountability. I would now like to give the floor to uh, Bernard Rebert, who has done research on the French Convention for the Climate. I will ask you another follow-up question on this issue in a second, uh, but I think you will also draw on this issue possibly for your introduction. Thank you so much. Thank you, and um, uh, I, I will return back on, on um, democratic deficit, but uh, we know already that uh, Zoom, it's uh, an incarnation deficit. So uh, the, the, t the title or the, the things I, I want to, to discuss with you is Promises of Citizens' Celebration to Tackle the Deficit Question Mark. And since uh, European past experience of uh, participative or deliberative democracy have convened a very small numbers of citizens, uh, we have only 1,600 citizens dialogue in four years for all over Europe. I have chosen to return on the French Grand Débat National. You have 10,000 local debates between 60 and 400 people in two months only. 
with 18 regional citizens assemblies and one of its outputs, the French Convention for the Climate, 150 citizens, nine months, with a question directly connected with our topic, combining both inclusion and economy, how to define structuring measures to manage in a spirit of social justice, to cut France greenhouse gas emissions by at least 40% four, by 2030 with respect to 1990. These two socio-political experiments, 15 million euros are very rich, and we have never reached this point on a European level with decision makers consideration, mediatic impact, and uh, the, uh, the numbers of citizens involved. So since I'm a philosopher, I will offer for this kickoff some distinctions to discuss and to discuss easy preconception on democratic deficit. Starting from um, the citizen, the so-called citizen, the ordinary citizen without any charge, any authorities, we can have five different conception of the deficit. The support between the represented and the representatives, the continuous democracy, and there it's an interesting point because it can be opinion polls, petitions, different kinds of pressions, lobbying, demonstration, and referendum. What is more democratic? The French referendum in 2005 or the treaty to establish a constitution for Europe. Uh, third, no interest is a deficit and critical citizenship understood as distress. This is a very important deficit of nowadays. It's very difficult because we have to move from this kind of critical citizenship to a very critical citizenship. And uh, the fifth, no ideas of the different networks of agencies, missions, authorities, and responsibilities. And we, if we consider democratic, we have three possibilities. The gap between the promises and the reality, the difference between the normative expectations and reality, or for us researchers, the normative and the descriptive, and eight, depending on the conflict between different conceptions of legitimacy. What would be a democracy without deficit? Taking all the theories of democracy are only the most convincing one. So I will, re I will have during a, our debate, um, I will I, I reconsider the uh, experiment of the Grand Débat National and the French Convention for the Climate under this eight uh, different entrants to tackle the question of deficit or democratic deficit. Yeah, thank you so much for bringing us back to, to, to very basic reflections. What are citizens and uh, what are engaged and critical uh, citizens? That's, that's, of course, very important. I always have an issue with the normal citizen. Are there abnormal citizens? Huh? So then I give the floor, um, but not with that question. Uh, sorry, Sophie. I give now the floor to, to Sophie, who also works on these is issues very regularly. Yes, thank you, Christine. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, and I have to say, um, at the European Policy Center, we work a lot on the conference on the future of Europe. So I'm very happy. Um, I'm not focusing on that. Uh, don't worry. Um, I'm focusing on the research question that I will uh, look at in the coming year. So uh, bear with me if it's first thoughts, because I will research that the next year with the Charlemagne Prize Academy. Um, and the question I ask myself is how um, social fairness and democracy are related at EU level, which is obviously a very big question, but it's one that I think is extremely important, especially in this times of crisis. Um, and I'd like to start with the COVID-19 crisis because I think uh, there's been a bit of analysis of what's been happening, but uh, it's continuing. And I think it's very important to kind of get a grasp of what is happening. Uh, and I try to look at um, numbers looking at economic recessions. And I have to say, I didn't find that much analysis on, on the long-term effects. All we know is that we need a recovery fund. There will be a huge economic recession and it's likely to translate into 
more political fragmentation. Hopefully not, but we could already see the differences between the frugal four and then fives and the southern countries during the negotiations in July during the EU Council summit. Um, and what we see now is obviously on a different topic, but we see that uh, there is a lot of fragmentation within the EU, also due to economic differences. So I think the European Commission took the right step forward to try to bring together the EU's economic recovery with a social sustainable and resilient agenda. So linking it to the twin transition of digital transformation and green agenda and not having this kind of sense of going back to business as usual, uh, as for instance, the German government tried to do with giving subsidies to car manufacturers when we know it's clearly not a sustainable way forward. Um, what we've seen in this year is that the social Europe agenda hasn't been really in the in the main focus of the German Council presidency, unfortunately, but uh, we had an event with a permanent representative of the uh, Portuguese Council presidency yesterday, and uh, it's pretty clear that uh, the social aspect will play a very important role in the next six months, which is, I think, something to welcome. In addition, what we can see also is that um, there's a clear understanding that social Europe isn't just an aspect that needs to be taken in a silo, but rather seen as a comprehensive, uh, to take a comprehensive approach on it. And you could see that with, for instance, the Just Transition Fund, uh, when it comes to the Green Deal, so making sure that there are no lagging behind regions or countries and that there is some social help to make sure that these transformative processes can happen in a way that is also sustainable socially. So, Looking at social fairness and democracy is difficult. All we know is that there has been a number of studies showing that uh, growing socioeconomic inequality has an obviously very negative effect on democracy. Uh, one, often it translates into a right wing populist vote, although we need to be careful here because the individual economic situation does not necessarily translate into a right wing populist vote, but rather this feeling of frustration, of fear for the future, and feeling that uh, lagging behind and not being taken on, and also not having the ability to, to in be included in the political process. Leading me to my second point uh, that high levels of inequality lead to poorer access to political participation. And I think that obviously reduces the quality of democracy as such. So um, I tried to identify two challenges the EU is currently faced with. One that is not talked much about, but I think the fact that the sense of justice has become much more divergent is a massive issue for the EU. Um, just to give a very stupid example, but uh, I think the fact that Jeff Bezos of Amazon, for instance, didn't uh, became much more richer during this crisis hasn't been such a such a big controversy, whereas other things such as immigrants again and again uh, are seen as something that are extremely divisive. So having a different sense of justice of citizens makes it much more difficult for uh, political decision makers to find compromise because there's different views on how uh, we should see a future and what is social fairness as such. And the second thing what we see also now with the vetoes of Hungary and Poland, even though I saw yesterday that Poland might be um, giving a, an option or might be willing to accept the MFF in the next generation EU package, but we see that authoritarian governments have a negative effect on democratic decision making in the EU and is blocking the ability of the EU to take decisions that are important. Interestingly enough, if you look at the domestic policies, for instance, the peace government has an extremely social agenda and often the EU is not seen as a priority in, in the political agenda of the country, so they don't necessarily vote for those parties because of their EU policies, but rather for their social policies, also showing the link of how important it is maybe to have uh, political parties that are pro-European, but also have a very strong social agenda. Um, I'll try to be fair, uh, but uh, to keep it short, but I have, I think, three points to make. Um, the first one is I feel that the EU has been trying to rebalance inequalities through structural and cohesion funds in the past. And what we see is that they need to take a much more holistic approach to that. Uh, also, not only focusing on socioeconomic equality, but also educational equality, health equality, for instance, now with the COVID even more so. Um, and also definitely looking at equality of all citizens to participate in the political process. There, the link to the Conference on the Future of Europe, um, 
I am quite pessimistic about it, unfortunately, because I think also that is, as Alberto said, in a top-down process, it is extremely difficult to have deliberative processes at EU level with 440 million EU citizens uh, that have very different access to citizenship education, for instance, and very different political systems as such. So I think it's, it's the right ambition, but uh, the methodology needs to be adapted um, and not only taken from the national to the EU level. That's my first point. The second point is also that you should have an understanding of democracy that goes much further than just having democracy in the political sense of the term, but also looking at, at all spheres of life. So for instance, also making sure that you have much more democratic processes in the economic sector. And uh, that's where I'm a big defendant of corps intermédiaire, as you would say, or intermediary bodies that have an extremely important role to play to create compromise in different policy areas to then bring it to the political process. So have a much more wide understanding of democracy as such um, with more aspects included in that would be, I think, very helpful. Um, and last but not least, I think that the crisis has shown that we have lacking solidarity mechanisms in the EU. And the question is, how can you incentivize uh, EU member states to show solidarity when it's in the EU's interest and also their citizens' interest uh, through political and institutional design? And there, that's the question I'm going to ask in the next year to see what can we do to change the little uh, wheels of the EU uh, maybe not treaty changes, because I think that's not a realistic option in the next years, but what can we do to make sure that we have a more efficient EU that is able to take decisions in the EU citizens' interest? And that was it. Thank you so much, Sophie, for also showing us that um, social fairness, social justice is really a cross-cutting issue. Um, I have two things to do now. First of all, I have to keep time, and I really would like to keep time in the sense that we don't do the mistake, or uh, don't repeat the mistake of the Conference on the Future of Europe, and don't give room for debate, yeah? So I have prepared a question for each speaker, um, but... It seems that we lost Christine for a second. <laughs> Good, we can have a break or what does it mean? Let, let, let us just uh, wait for her for, uh, for a moment. Uh, I will send her a message. Uh, she'll probably just rejoin in a second. What kind of deficit is it? What kind of deficit is it? <laughs> a digital deficit. <laughs> <laughs> but I think then, uh, if you wanted to take a two minute break until she's back and then we uh, get back to the questions and that, that's totally uh, okay. So uh, let's give it one minute. Thank you. I'm back. That's the thing with uh, Zoom nowadays. So I have a question for Sophie, but she would know the question anyway. Um, the oh. question is um, Christine about- is back. <laughs> Sorry, I'm Christine. Back. Yeah, I'm back and I have a question for Sophie. Um, so Good. the question is about democratic backsliding and, yes. um, and the effects of this. What can be done about this? And how do you see also the recent vetoes? You have already talked about this, linking um, certain issues and then saying, well, we will not agree to the recovery fund. Uh, big question, I would say, and uh, I'll, I'll try. I mean, it's difficult because democratic backsliding includes so many different aspects. Um, you could see yesterday with the European Democracy Action Plan that was presented by Vera Jourova that they focused on three points. They focused on fair and free elections, fighting disinformation and media freedom and pluralism. But that's only three parts of a much broader uh, un understanding of democracy where you also have corruption issues, where you have to make sure that you have equal access to citizenship education uh, and yeah, also social fairness in the sense. So making sure that you don't have democratic backsliding in the EU um, for the moment is difficult because some aspects haven't been really looked at. The main aspect that the EU has looked at is obviously the rule of law, um, because that's been one of the biggest issues, I would say, in the past years. And there, there's really a toolbox that exists. And 
I won't go through all the instruments, but only mention a few. You see very clearly that uh, it lacks efficiency when it comes to the Article 7 procedures due to a design flaw in the article itself, but also um, a process that hasn't been optimal. The most efficient um, effects have been the infringement procedures, um, where you had a lot of them against Hungary and Poland, like the Stop Soros law, the Lex NGO against foreign funded NGOs, or even the Lex CU and the Central U European University. What you can see there, although, is that it's extremely slow, uh, that maybe the Commission doesn't necessarily have all the, all the resources to make sure that you have all these infringement procedures. And uh, the sanctions are not necessarily deterrent in the sense that uh, it's either financial penalties that are taken from EU funds later, or they refer it back to national courts. Even though this is the legal procedure that still had the most impact, um, because the other dialogue sessions they had didn't really um, bring much um, change to it. Um, and also the European Commission tends to focus on soft law instruments such as re reports that are very welcome and I think very important to have a clear understanding of where the rule of law is at at European level, but is more of a name and shame effect than anything else because it doesn't have financial sanction attached to it. Um, I think the main point is not only necessarily looking through this technical prism, but looking at it from a political perspective. And there it gets much more trickier. Uh, we all know that the European People's Party um, has suspended Fidesz, but it's not thrown out yet. Uh, there's been a letter lately from, uh, I think, an Austrian MEP saying that it really needs to happen now. Um, but I think the German conservatives still refuse to do so or are very silent about it. So this is where you show that, that it gets to the nitty gritty. And um, I understand that obviously losing Fidesz MEPs means less political power. And that's not something people want necessarily, but it needs to happen. And so it needs to happen at a political level and also it needs to happen from other EU member states that would clearly say, this is not okay what you're doing. And that hasn't happened yet. The only thing we've seen is that uh, the Netherlands have, might start an interstate infringement procedure, which is a very new thing and quite a, what do you say? In French, you say pied de nez uh, to the commission saying that you're not doing your job basically, um, because that would mean that the, the Netherlands would file an infringement procedure against Poland um, which, yeah, it's, it's a, a new development and shows also that the European institutions need to do more. Sorry, I'm talking a lot, but it's one of my favorite topics. <laughs> uh, and I think the last point about the veto is what we can see now is that the EU institutions and especially the other EU member states with Germany at the front because of the German Council presidency uh, need to not let themselves be blackmailed and put pressure on Hungary and Poland because we are in a situation where the 25 other EU member states really need this recovery fund, really want the MFF to pass through. There's time constraints. So it's a perfect situation, I would say, from a negotiating perspective to just say that's not happening for you, especially not when it comes to the rule of law conditionality. The German Council presidency had put through an anti-corruption clause more than a rule of law conditionality and the European Parliament did great work trying to make it much broader and to make sure that it includes more aspects than just anti-corruption. And I think that's uh, that will be one of the most efficient mechanisms to ensure there's good rule of law uh, in the EU. Also knowing that it's one of the fundaments of mutual cooperation, that the single market depends on ensuring, I mean, to trust other judiciaries. So it's it's not a small issue. And I think it's, it's crucial for the EU's future to make sure that uh, we have safeguard rule of law in, in that respect. Thank you so much, Sophie. Um, I hope that my Zoom connection uh, remains stable. They're building around here, so you never know. Um, so I now give the floor to uh, Berna. And uh, what are the main takeaways from your research on the French Convention for the Climate um, when it comes to making the European Union more democratic? So I'm aware of the fact that it's a huge question, but I'm sure you will be able to break it down. It, it's a huge question and it's a very huge experiment. It's a bit like in, as if in France, we have already had the debate on Europe and uh, uh, with a, a more powerful uh, uh, means. But, but to, to, to make it very brief, uh, for, for some theorists, um, the institutions, the legal ones, the legal institutions are the best guarantees for democracy. 
and uh, they are very reluctant and pessimistic towards uh, democracy through communicational socialization. They think it's impossible. And what is funny is and that you have uh, on, on one side this kind of people, and on the other side you have what I call the participative or participation entrepreneur, like a uh, moral entrepreneur. And sometimes they use people from the first uh, circle, for example, Habermas, to think that, okay, we can manage and we can do that with an ordinary citizen, it will be very easy and uh, participation will save democracy. So I think, and it's, it was really interesting with this convention because uh, for the first time, if, if, if I'm well informed, uh, they have legal, um, uh, a legal committee, they have called that um, a logistic committee. So you have a professional in, in law and this, these people were uh, embedded in the process to translate the, the intentions of the citizens in robust, something almost close because you know it's very difficult to reach and to uh, write the, the law altogether. It, it's a, an institutional process. And what is funny is that through this and um, uh, despite some people want to use this legal committee to force the president to accept all the proposal of the citizen, it was a, a bit the opposite. It was a lesson for the citizen to understand the complexity, how is it to build the law? And it was only on the French level. So you can imagine for the European level where you have the problem of tangibility, even for people who are lobbyists. So, uh, uh, and, and perhaps to finish with that, um, the citizens have had the opportunity to become more citizen. So to tackle, to accept uh, the critiques of others, because most of the people, they think that what they think it's good, especially when they speak about justice. But as you know, it's a very contested concept. And if justice is the same for everybody, you would never have left and right, for example, in, in politics. And perhaps what um, this experiment has in common with, with Europe is that uh, without the crisis of the yellow vest in France, we would never have had such big debate. I don't say that the yellow vest have wanted to do that. On the opposite, they, they were very reluctant to that, but Macron take this, the President Macron take this opportunity to, 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 to put a, we, we call that in French, a contrefeu, a kind of wall to uh, propose this debate. You, you have something to say, enter into this process and you can uh, do it here. And for Europe is the same thing. I was discussing with, with somebody who is a specialist in Europe and sometimes he said to me, you know, for Europe, if Europe advanced through crisis, so sometimes crises are very helpful to build new things. But I'm not sure that the crisis is there, such a crisis like the yellow vest crisis we had to decide what we want for Europe. I, will, I think we will have to, to, to wait much, much, much more years. Thank you so much for making such a succinct link between what happened in France and the European Union. I now give the floor uh, to Ian, and I also have a huge question uh, to you. Um, I would like you to reflect a little bit more. You did that already at the beginning, but to reflect on the conference on the future of Europe. Um, how do, but I would like you to take one specific angle. So the follow up. Yeah. So how do we make sure? And that's one of the things about policymaking. How do we make sure that the decisions that are taken within the conference um, are actually followed up upon. What is your view? Do we need treaty change or not? Um, I think the answer is, am I on mute? Yeah. Um, I think the answer is that depends. Um, the, the point I would, I, the point I was making earlier about the national parliaments, um, many, there could be many, many positive changes that would not require treaty change um, for in, in that case. But of course, anything that's more, um, anything that's more radical, anything that's more uh, 
foundational would need treaty change. Um, I think that there, it just, I'm gonna make a general point as quickly as I can about um, this kind of a conference. Um, it's, you have, you have to have buy-in from all the three major institutions, um, Commission, European Parliament, and Council, um, and and they are and 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 we're waiting for a joint declaration that would actually start the uh, conference process. Um, the paradox is that if you want uh, more creative uh, treaty change, um, it should you're more likely to get that if it's a more intergovernmental process. So if you had, for example, um, a decision to essentially go around the, Hungary and Poland and uh, create some kind of a new mechanism, whether it's treaty-based or other kind of legal mechanism to have a budget for 25, um, that's an intergovernmental decision. Um, and you'll end up, but it's gonna be a very top-down process. Uh, and just as was the case with the fiscal compact treaty. And so most of the kind of constitutional change that's happened since Lisbon has happened outside the EU treaties uh, framework. Um, and often it has involved um, uh, intergovernmental agreements that are outside, outside the framework and that do not involve all 20, all, all the EU member states signing on to get around the problem of the veto. Um, and so any kind, of, any kind of movement like that is extremely unlikely to emerge from the conference process because, uh, because you have um, the EU institutions are so wedded in making sure that, the, that everything stays within the framework of the EU treaties. Okay, thank you so much, Ian. I would now like to say something before I give the next speakers the, the screen, um, is that we would then like to open the discussion after the next two interventions. And please write your uh, any questions you have or any comments into the chat so we can um, summarize that. Um, so you can start typing away already now. Um, so I would now like to give the floor to Vitor with again a very challenging uh, question. Could you identify two areas of this uh, alleged democratic deficit that need to be tackled to reform the EU institutionally? So it's about active citizens engagement. How can we actually ensure the citizens get the information um, that they need at crucial times? Yeah. So Two key words are the trilogues between the uh, European Parliament and the Council, and another one is the Council itself, the way it takes legislative decisions. There still seems to be um, a black box around these decision-making procedures. So how can we improve this? Um, I mean, I would say that there are two main areas uh, that should be addressed. And of course, I'm saying this from a point of view of someone that works in political integrity and transparency, right? So the first one is a broad uh, legislative transparency, including the trilogue process. So, I mean, this goes into the field of, for example, for lobbyists, which organizations are influencing the institutions? With what budget are they influencing? Who works for them? What positions do they defend? With whom have they talked to? And, um, um, for example, for trilogues would be who is present even in the trilogue meetings. Many, many times people don't even know that. Who, who is there and who has provided input to that draft legislation? Um, I would even ask people uh, to, to do the exercise of, uh, for example, for the commission, which publishes the top, the meetings uh, between the top officials and the and lobbyists, these meetings are published in nine, uh, just over 90 different websites. So each commissioner, each cabinet member publishes in a different website and each member of parliament that publishes it and some are obligated, only some, uh, is is uh, published in their own web page in the parliament, meaning 705 web pages. So 
who has the time, a normal citizen that wants to see a process that they are personally interested in because it will affect their lives or their business? Um, who can understand, have a, a true picture of what is happening uh, by looking at almost 800 different websites so that you can puzzle together the smallest uh, image uh, that you can get of what is happening and this this is to to say of of the information that is available because as i just mentioned the majority of the information is not available especially for trilogues uh, many times you only see the end of the process when everything has come out and everything has been agreed um, and the second uh, wouldn't be such so broad it would be on council transparency because Right now, it is impossible, and here I make a distinction between national parliaments and governments, uh, because it is impossible for a citizen to hold their governments, their national governments to account if they don't know what is the position of their country at EU level. And right now, it is impossible to know that because uh, you just cannot know what is what what your country is saying um, in the council discussions, whether it is at working group level or other levels, because th that information is not published. And it does happen that what is defended publicly at national level is different of what is uh, defended in those meetings, which are happening at closed doors. Um, and there was a, a case by a, an NGO, Access Info, that took the the council to 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 court because they asked for access to a document in which the the many parts of that document were deleted. So, which member states have proposed or what were their positions in the in the draft legislation, and all of that was deleted, and they won. In, in the European Court of Justice against the council and they had to publish that, um, that document. And, and so what the, what the <clears throat> court was saying was, well, you cannot hide behind the legislative process. You need to be transparent about what is happening. Well, what has happened since then is that often now member states positions that were before in those documents now no longer show. So what you now see is that a member state has, uh, has um, stated reservations, but it doesn't say which member state. So they're going around the decisions that were made by the courts. Um, and this is extremely problematic because um it, it it allows for this traditional brussels uh, shaming in which the the member states um uh, are taking the decisions but then when there's a pushback by citizens at national level they go oh it wasn't us it, it was brussels but who is brussels exactly and it, it this greatly contributes to the loss of trust in the european union that you see year upon year and upon year and it's it's not just NGOs that are saying that, right? It's not just Transparency International, uh, but it's also mentioned, uh, it's clear that journalists take that position, academics mention it as well. And oddly enough, the majority of national parliaments, uh, the, some, some, some time ago, a letter which was drafted by the House of Representatives of the Netherlands, and was signed by majority of, uh, uh, of uh, parliaments around the EU. And this is, I, and I, I call everyone's attention to this because it, it, this is the situation where we are now. The national parliaments were writing the council, which is composed of the permanent representations of their own governments, asking for more transparency. And their national parliaments were saying that the council itself was a black box. And I actually have that letter here, which I will share in the chat so that people can see. Um, and I think th this shows that sometimes the absurdity uh, uh, that uh, which we have reached where uh, a specific individual is not able to see 
what is happening in the institutions and is not able to see what their own governments uh, are defending. And this is not just true for citizens, it's true for the national parliaments as well. Thank you so much. Um, we actually did research on this um, topic of national parliaments trying to get access to, to trilogues, and we called it uh, um, national parliaments in the kennel of trilogues, when can they bark? And they can't bark because they don't know what's happening. Um, so it seems to be a really, really big uh, issue. And uh, the interviews that we had, people were very disillusioned. So um, we talked to national parliamentarians and uh, parliamentary um, liaison officers. Um, okay, but um, I should not speak. I will now um, actually give the floor, I was getting a bit lost, sorry. I will give the floor to, to Alberto and ask him a question that you already raised that at the very beginning, um, your recent research. So you're also very prolific and work on very many different topics. And at the moment, you're really focusing on this very large participatory playing field of the European Union, and you're looking at the Commission's public uh, consultation. So one of these things is always who is empowered, who is not. We just talked about this already, access uh, to information, uh, possibility to actually provide input that also um, yeah, requires a lot of skills, etc. So I would like to, to ask you, who wins, who loses? Thank you, Christine, for giving me the chance to uh, continue uh, presenting what Vitor presented as a systemic issue, right? A problem of access, access to policy, to the policy process, access to uh, the decision makers. Uh, I think by now in the title of my article is really about leveling the participatory field, is the idea that the European institutions can no longer assume all stakeholders have the same access, have the same voice, and have the same influence vis-a-vis -vis decision makers. This is not the case, right? So we can no longer accept a formal understanding of the principle of political equality. Political equality is enshrined in the treaty since 2009. Uh, it is a provision that remained dead letter. It simply says that the institution should give equal attention to all stakeholders, but there are no substantive reading of such a provision. And that's exactly what I contend. I argue that the institutions are procedurally obliged to ensure all parties get the same access to the decision-making. And this means that they need to embrace a proactive interpretation of such a provision. They need to make sure that at the end of the day, uh, everybody will have access to the information, example coming from Vitor regarding the trialogues, but also proactive access to all the information in the regulation of access to document. Access to document is also enshrined in the Charter of Fundamental Rights. All the channels of participation I've been discussed earlier on should also be proactively made available to all citizens. This obviously entails a completely different paradigm in relation to what the institutions are supposed to do in order to implement uh, the participatory democracy, which is enshrined in the treaty. And here we need power shifting reforms, reforms capable of giving everybody a chance when it comes to access to information, uh, to literacy, to engagement, because only by doing so, only by embracing a substantive understanding of the principle of political equality, um, participation will become autonomous, a source of legitimation of the union, which is autonomous forum representation. Otherwise, participation will simply be not only ancillary, but it will be entirely controlled by the representative system. So if you are serious about what is written in the treaty, we need to make an extra effort. What kind of reforms we can envisage? Uh, most of the reforms I've been trying to put forward are quite innovative. Some of them are quite radical. But you know what is radical today, tomorrow might appear mainstream. And the hope is that some institutions will be willing within the Conference on the Future of Europe and beyond this to experiment some of those. Let me give you an example. We face a major issue in the access 
uh, to public consultation, but this is true also for ECIs, this is true also for petitions. Why don't we create a consultation fee? So all those actors who want to consult, who want to influence the decision makers should pay an amount, not only to register to the transparency register, but also pay an amount which is proportional to the overall revenue they make or the overall spending into lobbying. That's what Elizabeth Warren called excessive uh, lobbying tax in the United States context. I simply call it a registration fee that you need to pay if you want to consult. All this funding will go into a fund and this fund will be redistributed among public interest organizations who actually struggle to get there. A very different idea um, is that of civic time off. So the European Union, the member states incentivizing employers to give free time to their employees in order to engage with civil society organizations, with their communities, not only when they vote, when it's voting day, some companies already do, but also on a weekly or a monthly basis. So this is more broadly uh, skill sharing. The idea that employees have tools, have skills, but they don't give them away to civil society, to their communities, but should they do so, obviously we would uh, uh, strengthen uh, the civil society capacity and therefore the literacy and the access that those organizations today do not have. So in a nutshell, we need to be bold enough to rethink uh, the problem of access as a prerequisite for participation to become meaningful. And this applies virtually to all what we have been discussing. It applies also to the delicate issue on how to link the citizen input to a representative process. What we saw uh, today with the Convention Climat, that's a problem. How can we ensure that the citizens who have been randomly selected and civil society who share those ideas will create enough pressure on governments, on the French government in this case, to take up those propositions? We're going to see the same problem with the Conference on the Future of Europe. How can we ensure such a follow-up? And for this, we need a, a civic infrastructure capable of holding uh, accountable decision makers once these democratic exercises, which tend to be ad hoc, uh, will be at the end, will no longer be there. This requires a lot of political courage. It requires some experimentation, but we see a lot of experimentation happening, as we heard today from Bernard, all across Europe, from the bottom up, at the city local level. To make this transnational, it will require even further a further attempt. And to make it at the times of COVID, obviously, it makes it even more complicated. But this is not a reason not to try. These are emergency, emergency time, and we see uh, that there is really a demand or an expectation also of citizens to actually be more involved, to understand more uh, what is ongoing on in Europe. This expectation is growing and COVID simply made it a bit more observable than in the past. Thank you so much, uh, Alberto, um, for also coming up with very bold uh, ideas. I would now like to give the screen to Serena to summarize uh, the chat. Um, we didn't get so many questions, but nevertheless, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christine. Um, so we have a few questions from our participants. Um, the first will be for uh, Bernard. So Nicolai found uh, your figures very impressive and would like to ask for some more details about the French model of citizen engagement if you would like to answer that. Uh, do, do you prefer me to actually go through all the questions and then, okay. Yeah, um, maybe we can select the questions and then play them to the three speakers or how many there are. And then we just wrap this up because we have to have coffee at 11 o'clock. Of course, um, always uh, related to that, uh, Leonie asks also, given all the different current global threats, uh, what precisely constitutes a crisis that would create a similar effect for the conference uh, as the Yellow Vest did in France? Uh, and it is perhaps more a question of citizens feeling directly affected by a crisis. Um, and then we have a question for Sophie. Uh, so Matilda, uh, ask her where are views or of justice diverging and how should the EU balance ensuring justice within countries with subsidiarity? And what does the EU needs, need to be most aware of to do this? 
And related to this, the last question uh, from Felix, uh, to what extent uh, do the speakers ex uh, expect uh, those engaging in protest and civil disobedience to partake in, in the Conference of Europe and other participatory processes and how to get them to engage. Okay, thank you so much for summarizing the questions. Due to the time, I would suggest that we uh, give Bernard and Sophie the floor. Um, um, Alberto just shared also extensively some of his um, insights and we would be very happy to hear more about this. And we will have more uh, panels during the, during the relay um, project. So we will zoom in on this. Um, so first of all, I give the screen to Bernard and then to Sophie. And at 11 o'clock, we will have coffee. And at 11.15, we will come back with another panel to which we very much look forward. So Bernard, you had a lot of interest for your research. That's wonderful. It it's not it's not my talk it's it's the reality we have in in uh, i say many times we are very lucky as researcher to have so, in two years so many experiment to to uh, observe uh, it's it's impossible to answer to the first question because if it's a two two hours talk and it, it's very rich but but uh, uh, i will uh, say things uh, um, uh, answering the second question the question of the crisis it's uh, a banalité a tragische banalité uh, to speak about crisis, crisis is everywhere. But it, as I think it's very true in, in the question that you have a crisis affected you and some are too far or you are not directly affected. And with the yellow vest crisis, you have people affected by, by uh, okay, it was only one, one thing. It was, uh, you know, uh, to pay a bit more for your petrol. And if you see, for example, the, 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 the ecological transition, it was not a bad thing. It was a very good thing but okay it was not just and 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 uh, you are there uh, you, for people who are living in in the province it's it's much more um, a problem than than people living uh, with uh, public transportation in in cities so uh, it, it was very understandable that it will create some problem and and people will say okay uh, it's very unjust and unfair and because of that every saturday we will uh, do demonstration in the Champs Elysees. Everybody has seen that. There, you have the crisis in front of you. And even if you are the president of, of, of France, you don't know what will happen the next Saturday. So you have to propose something. You can, okay, you can be like Le General de Gaulle and you can uh, send uh, the CRS and to be a more a stronger or a, an urban way to do and uh, to tackle this kind of things. Uh, and you can be like uh, La République En Marche, you, you, will, you will propose something new. You have no parties and you can be a president. So, ah, okay, you can have a grand débat, but to organize a grand débat, when you, you, you see, for example, the mess to organize this grand débat on the future of Europe, but you have to organize between November and January, it's impossible. But it was, it was possible, not because of Macron, because of the resilience of, of the small cities, the small villages to organize 10,000 uh, 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 small debates everywhere. It, it was not because of Macron. And it's okay. So, this is the first. The second thing is to be affected is not enough. Everybody is affected. In the transition, everybody is affected. But you are not on the same side sometimes, depending on what will change. And there you have the next step towards democracy how we speak when we disagree. And returning on the convention, what is really funny is, first of all, it's very difficult for ordinary citizen, not for citizen involved in civic society organization where they have strong arguments, they are like lawyers or advocates or advocacy. Okay, they are, they are professional. But for this uh, a citizen uh, chosen by sortition, it's very easy for them to propose things, but when they have to select, when they have to, to have the courage to say, okay, we will go to, uh, with a question for a referendum, they are very, very cool. They are not political at all. They have asked the question, please, can you give us counsel? What is a consens consensual question for a referendum? So it's, it's totally the opposite. So I'm very quick, but only to say that uh, we have to be really deliberative in these things. And I'm not sure that on the European level, it will be um, uh, rich because for many people, they think that participation and deliberation is only respected, uh, respectful communication. No, 
it's a place where you have to be confronted with more pluralism and with the uncertainties. And you have to be deliberative, not only in the small mini publics, but everywhere. And when you see the quality of the debate on the, every parliament, and sometimes in, in the government, you can uh, take some conclusions. So I, I stop there. Thank you so much. And the last word is to Sophie. The last word, dear, <laughs> for this <laughs> panel. So the question that I was asked, I think is extremely interesting and um, I would have to think about it um, to respond to it. I think it's it's one of the, the ground questions about European integration, that's where you see the the lacking coherence of a work in progress in a sense because if i think we have an understanding that social cohesion is important for the eu it wasn't the case before and i think now we see that there's an issue with competences as well um i would still advocate for subsidiarity but the question is um how do we make sure that we recognize when there is a european interest and when there is a national interest or regional interest um and maybe just to give one example, as um, I currently worked a lot on, on education issues, education is, for instance, one area where the EU has very little uh, competences. There is a, a clear sense of national sovereignty when it comes to it. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's a crucial our policy area to make sure that we have a common understanding of what um, European values are, for instance, or just what, what we understand as democracy. And I think I participated in a, in a panel discussion on the East-West divide only last week. And what was clear is that there is a different understanding of what of the nation state, of what democracy is uh, in some of the Central and Eastern European countries, also due to history than, for instance, in France or in Germany. And I think as long as national governments don't understand that there is a need for more exchange and not necessarily uh, to have a unified, harmonized, uh, top-down understanding of what democracy is, but rather ensure that there's more mobility, more exchange, and let uh, a European understanding emerge from citizens, um, then, then we have an issue. Um, and I, I hope it will happen, but it doesn't look like it at the moment. And I think that shows also this kind of divergence between having uh, increasing common challenges that need to be tackled, but also this lack of intelligibility of European decision making, um, and also this lacking link between European citizens, also related to the fact that we don't have a European public sphere and that um, the European decision making system is some is extremely complicated and also um, lacks this typical link that exists between citizens and its decision makers in a democracy normally. Um, but it's, it's a very good question. And I think it may be also time to rethink the subsidiarity principle in that sense. Um, I'll, I'll go back to you maybe next year when I finish my research. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Sophie. I would like to thank everybody on this uh, panel. Excellent contributions. I think we, we covered an enormous ground. I learned a lot. 750 websites, wow, where information is spread. Um, these kinds of things. So um, very, very interesting uh, debate. We could continue for the whole day. Um, we will now, however, have coffee. I would also like to thank the campus team for making all of this work. I would also like to thank uh, Serena uh, for summarizing the questions and, of course, the audience uh, for being here with us. But please stay because we have a whole day in store for you. So we will come back at 11.15 and there will be a panel um, chaired by my fantastic colleague Giselle on promoting EU values and assuming global leadership, also very small topic. So we um, come back to uh, with fresh minds to this topic at 11.15. Bye bye. See you in a bit. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.
Okay, welcome back. It is uh, 1115. So we are going to restart our conference. I hope you have all um, been able to take the chance to, to get some coffee. It's a pity that we couldn't uh, drink that together. I now give the floor to my colleague Giselle Bosse um, to share the panel on promoting EU values and assuming global leadership. I will introduce Giselle to those who don't know her. She's an associate professor. She has since recently, congratulations with that, a Jean Monnet chair of EU external relations. So she's perfectly fit, uh, of course, to chair this panel. And she is also director of the Center of European Research in Maastricht, Serim. And she's also, I mean, what don't you do? She's of course also associate dean for education at my faculty or our faculty. So Giselle, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Christine. And uh, thank you to the whole uh, team in, of Brussels campus in, uh, in, uh, in Brussels uh, for, for organizing such a fantastic and very timely conference. Now, uh, I'm very uh, pleased and uh, also feel honored uh, that we uh, got this whole panel um, uh, just to talk about um, the EU's um, role uh, in international relations, or more specifically the headline uh, goal of the EU of a stronger Europe uh, in the world. Um, and that, of, of course, is not by no means a very uh, small topic. Um, and uh, I would just uh, also uh, follow the uh, previous example and introduce uh, this particular um, headline goal elaborated by the Commission um, and then outline a couple of uh, questions uh, for discussion with our group of uh, fantastic um, and highly uh, qualified uh, guest speakers who I will then also briefly introduce and we have six panelists uh, here in this uh, panel and uh, therefore also time is, I guess, a critical uh, factor. Now to introduce the EU's headline uh, goal, this is officially called, uh, this is the fourth goal apparently, a stronger Europe in the world and one of the most yeah, I think it's a so good time actually to reflect on this because first December apparently I, I, I noticed was one year um, of this uh, commission um, under Ursula von der Leyen um, and since then uh, we have, um, or the EU has been uh, implementing theoretically um, also this particular headline goal. Um, and what has been one of the most controversial parts of uh, the, the EU's uh, goal with relation to a stronger Europe is of course, and I think everybody will be very aware of this, that the Commission explicitly calls itself a geopolitical commission. And uh, with a very strong focus on external action, uh, thriving or thriving to be a more pragmatic long term uh, or more towards a more long term approach to securing uh, what they then term as yeah, securing our global leadership. So in combination being a geopolitical commission um, and securing global leadership, I mean, these are very strong and have been very controversial uh, terms and also uh, a strategy uh, hotly debated. And when looking further into this particular headline goal, one comes across uh, further uh, very strong assertions, uh, but assertions that do not come without contradictions. In fact, um, the entire part on a stronger Europe has been described by some uh, colleagues uh, in academia, but also um, in the media, as perhaps a biggest contradiction in terms. And when one reads the uh, headline goal, uh, for example, the EU strives um, to upholding, updating and upgrading a rules-based global order, nothing necessarily surprising about that, but then with the new nuance that Europe needs to be a more geopolitical uh, actor and quote, to advance our values and quote, to promote Europe in, Europe's interests. Now, uh, in, in, in all of this, you know, being a geopolitical commission, but at the same time upholding a rules-based global order and uh, promoting values and interests at the same time is indeed perhaps slightly contradictory. And there's nothing in this headline goal that would uh, offer a uh, explanation of potential tensions or contradictions. And to name but one, and I believe this is also what we will engage with in the, uh, our discussion, um, is for example, uh, relating again to this geopolitical commission, 
um, that no definition of geopolitics is given um, at no point and uh, von der Leyen has uh, at times you know gave certain interpretation of what is meant but that was never particularly conclusive and what is most controversial here is that of course the EU has traditionally or is perceived as a project uh, that was precisely aimed uh, to be constructed as an antithesis, if one may say so, of geopolitics and of balance of power. So precisely, you know, building up a European project in the sense of, uh, yeah, that was rejecting um, geopolitics and specifically you know, taking the uh, experience of the Second World War, um, it was set up as a rejection of geopolitics that were, you know, that that was what driving the past. So, you know, what is happening and um, what geopolitics is von der Leyen talking about? Um, and also, what does that mean then uh, in terms of the sources of authority and legitimacy that the European Union has? So I guess that is one, one of the big areas um, of, of questions um, we would uh, want to address uh, in this particular panel. And secondly, of course, uh, the tension between promoting values and interests, uh, not necessarily a new debate, uh, but it, it becomes an interesting debate in the context also of legitimacy, legitimacy of regional organizations, who is intervening or setting human rights standards, would that be the EU as an international organization uh, or regional organization rather, or regional alliance um, in how far uh, is this something that should be left to the United Nations? And again, the question of authority and legitimacy and to what extent this tension between values and interests can be reconciled or rather not. So this would be on the level of contradictions in terms um, where it would be uh, good to debate uh, with this panel. And secondly, what one could possibly term looking at the headline goal is what I would term contradictions in practice. So when we further read into the headline goal, the EU again being very uh, ambitious, uh, talking about a strategy with Africa, the Caribbean and the Pacific, and that in the context, and you probably already know where people would argue, many of my colleagues, uh, in fact, um, that China um, has already been active in Africa for quite a considerable amount of time, and the EU might be slightly behind the curve. Um, not just in that region, because you will recall that just one month ago, in November 2020, um, there was the big China-Asia-Pacific trade deal uh, concluded, which also somewhat, I guess, uh, comes ahead of the EU's plans in uh, the Pacific region. So, uh, plus there is also the ambition to create a new Eastern partnership, always nice when the EU uh, wants to create uh, new uh, things that actually sound very similar to what they've been in the past, um, but a new Eastern partnership post 2020, looking at exactly that region, I think we all are aware of the fact that this is a, rather a ring of fire than a ring of uh, friends, as the EU usually used to term it, and in the region, uh, re very recently erupted, I mean, we don't and look, of course, at the Ukraine conflict, uh, even earlier, um, uh, the Georgia uh, war, uh, and now Nagorno-Karabakh. And in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, by all uh, you know, judgments, uh, the EU doesn't play a role uh, whatsoever. So here, a formidable ch challenge or a contradiction in practice. Uh, similarly, the EU advocating a strong WTO, uh, which is also familiar, but at the same time, it's quite familiar to us too, um, that it was in fact the European Union in the beginning of the 2000s that de facto lifted that own kind of imposed moratorium on bilateral or concluding bilateral uh, trade deals, free trade areas um, uh, with, with the rest of the world. And uh, so in one way or another, that also then uh, seemed to be uh, contradicting the principles of uh, international governments and commitment to international organizations. So here we can also or should debate. Um, and then also the EU's ambition, a stronger role for the euro and also stronger use of financial sanctions vis-a-vis -vis other countries. Um, here one can also question the extent to which sanctions are the right way to go, uh, again linked to legitimacy authority of the EU as an international actor, and perhaps also the very practical implication that a lot of these financial sanctions in the past um, have been annulled by the European uh, Union's own 
Court of Justice. Uh, I'm asking another question about effectivity of, of these goals. And, and finally, of course, also that the EU wants to take this leading role in setting human rights standards, upholding international humanitarian law, but setting human rights standards, of course, adding a, a slightly new, new nuance uh, relating back to the point I made earlier, you know, what are actually the sources of authority um, and legitimacy of the EU? So I don't want to talk too much further. I think the uh, general contents of the headline go relatively clear. Um, so what would we proposal what to do in this panel is that in the first round of uh, uh, contributions by the panelists, we would be looking into these yeah, contradictions um, in discourse and in practice, um, as just highlighted, and uh, and and uh, see also this fresh, uh, our, the expertise of the uh, colleagues um, and and relate to to looking at these contradictions. And then secondly, and I think that would be a very nice way to relate to the overall relay theme of this conference and project is that we could perhaps debate also together with the audience um, again zooming in on this question of sources of authority and legitimacy and how does the relay come into this it is mainly that in recent literature um, what we read uh, by for example by Thalberg and CERN and others that sources of authority of international organizations of which one could consider the EU or should consider the EU to be one as it's not a state um, there is the sources of authority ground in beliefs within the constituencies or within the European Union, but also by an external audience, and that could be defined in different ways, of course, um, depending on who is uh, sort of this information is relayed to. Um, and and uh, it, is, it is about the beliefs of the constituency and the external audience to the extent to which such a political institution like the EU um, exercises its authority uh, appropriately or not. And perhaps that is a nice theme to explore also together with the panelists coming with their different backgrounds um, and also relating to different sorts of audiences, regions um, uh, in the world, and to look into the sources of uh, legitimacy and authority that the EU may or may not have especially with the ambition to become a more geopolitical uh, actor. Right, and I stop here and start to introduce in the order uh, that they feature um, on the program, our honorable guest speakers, and I'm very happy uh, to welcome uh, all of them. Uh, the first one being uh, Marie Walter Franke, uh, who is affiliate policy fellow at the Jacques Delors Center, working on EU migration and asylum policy and she's currently writing her PhD at the Free University of Berlin and uh, dealing very much also with human rights, ethics, law and politics um, there in her program. Then I uh, would like to introduce uh, Manuel Müller who is a senior researcher at the Institute for European Policy in Berlin. Uh, his expertise ranges from democratic legitimation, political system, institutional reform in the EU, um, to European public sphere, European narratives, European elections, European political parties, and of course all of this um, relating then also to the external dimension of the European Union. Then I would like to introduce Alena uh, Vieira. Uh, she is Associate Professor in International Relations at Minho University in Portugal. Uh, she is a PhD, holds PhD in Political Science from the University of Erlangen and Nuremberg. She was visiting researcher at various uh, uh, illustrative a range of institutions, the Zeigel Stiftung, um, Leuven University, um, she has funds from Reichsberg and Jubileos from the Volkswagen Stiftung, you name it, and uh, of course a renowned scholar also on uh, Russia, uh, Belarus and the Eastern Partnership in particular. Next, I'm uh, more than honored to introduce Veronica uh, Junjan, who's Assistant Professor in Public Management at the University of Twente. Uh, she has degrees in Public Administration and Sociology from the US and Romania. And she, her research mainly focuses on decision making in local level governments uh, in the context of a session. And at the moment, she is looking at processes of public performance management and EU multi level governments, public sector reforms. 
also in the context of enlargement in Central and Eastern, Eastern Europe. Next is Ringo Ossewarde, uh, who is Associate Professor in Sociology of Governance at the University of Twente. Uh, he has uh, holds uh, degrees from the University of Rotterdam and the London School of Economics. And he is uh, in his research concerned with the relationship between transformation, societal challenges, societal resilience, technology and governance issues um, relating uh, to policy and authority levels in globalizing European society. And last but certainly not least, let me introduce uh, Julian Romanischi. He is uh, also a fellow of the Karls Price Academy and the Center for Advanced Security, Strategic and Integration Studies. Um, of the University of Bonn, and uh, he has been lecturer um, at the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences for International Relations at New York University, and he also happens to have been a colleague of us here um, at European Studies at Maastricht University. And uh, currently his uh, research is also very much focused on EU international relations, um, arms trade, uh, and also uh, looking at the global strategy of the European Union and security and defense policy. Now, without much further ado, uh, on the first theme, may I invite our guest speakers to talk about uh, the EU's first or the fourth headline goal on a stronger Europe in the world, uh, with the focus on these uh, contradictions in discourse and practice and the implications. May I give the floor to Marie? Thank you very much, uh, Joseph, for this kind of introduction. Thank you to the Relay Program and to the Chairman Prize Academy for having me. Um, so um, I'm more of a, a specialist of the internal dimension uh, of uh, European migration and asylum policies, but I would like to make a couple of remarks relating to the headline goal um, and the Geopolitical uh, Commission that relate to my research area. Um, so uh, we've seen uh, a lot has happened in this year. Um, of course, uh, the commission was put a little bit off track by the pandemic and uh, that impacted its ability to realize the goals as initially planned. Uh, what has been delivered in our field of migration and asylum policy was a very much expected fresh start, or at least that was the ambition. And uh, at the end of September, we had a big package of reform that was unveiled by uh, the commissioners um, Ita Johansson and the vice president Margarita Chinas, who is um, the um, vice president for promoting the European way of life. So that overlaps a little bit with the, the global aspect, but it's much more inward looking um, uh, portfolio. Um, what concerns, however, the global aspect in this package is that, of course, migration management is at the core of the whole aspect and uh, of the whole package. And one important aspect of this is cooperation with the EU partners in terms of managing migration, tackling the root causes, tackling routes, tackling transit, and dealing with uh, especially return and readmission. So now, if we look at uh, the ambition of the EU of having a productive cooperation with all sorts of partners that are relevant in that area, um, what the, is said uh, in uh, with relation to, to, to the, the proposal in the pact is that the EU wants to have tailor-made agreements with lots of different countries that they want to act as a, as a bloc, uh, also in, in co-organizing um, supportive programs in these separate, separate countries using all of the EU's resources to do so, uh, from trade policy um, to uh, development aid and so on. So um, as uh, Giselle was saying, this is repackaged old news, I would say, uh, to, be, um, to be quite fair, because that's what the EU has been striving to do with its limited competencies uh, for a long time already. Um, what's interesting, however, from the perspective of these partner countries is that this external dimension, especially the, the ambition to improve cooperation and increase the returns of persons who did not get protection in the European Union or other migrants who, with no legal status, is that um, this was constructed within the pact in, in this kind of con consultation, big consultation program within Europe as a major aspect without having any prior consultation with the partners. So now we're coming to this and the commission is working to try to bring uh, member states with very different interests and very different uh, 
uh, networks together to, to negotiate new agreements with a number of partners, but these partners are also uh, not necessarily interested in this cooperation with the EU. And then the question remains, as always, what kind of pressure do we want to use? How do we want to influence these partners? What kind of carrots and sticks are we uh, providing? And this is not really uh, a cooperation on, a, on an equal footing. So that, that's, um, that would be one area of, of tensions and contradictions. Um, secondly, uh, a second point I wanted to mention, uh, the whole asylum migration passage is very much inward looking. We are looking at at, at debates around what is solidarity, what should it be, what do member states owe each other in terms of support in, during pressure or crisis, um, how, how do we deal as a group with disembarking people that have been rescued at sea. And this is all very much issues of, of internal cohesion and, and how do we cooperate between member states that have very different interests um, and very, very different understandings of what the EU's values or added value maybe is. Um, but what's for sure is that if we look at the corresponding debates going on globally with the global compacts on asylum and on migration, this is completely impeding the potential that the EU would have as a bloc to play a leading role um, at the UN level. And also it makes it quite complicated for the EU to cooperate with other uh, groups of, the, of nations um, because we don't really have a well-defined common interest. We have a lowest common interest in closing up the EU borders and that's basically everything that uh, the members can agree on so far. And a last point that I wanted to mention with relation to the human rights aspect, um, the, the EU has tried to brand itself as a normative leader, uh, shaper of international norms. And to, uh, to some extent uh, it is, and it does also in this field of asylum, if we look at the, the establishment of uh, lots of very important procedural safeguards, um, the, uh, also the respect of the right to asylum that is anchored in the EU charter. There is a lot of normative um, added value of everything that's been going on in asylum and migration at the European level. But we look, when we look at the actual practice and what are the urgent and important and crucial issues to solve as a bloc, um, I will, of course, mention the situation on Lesbos right now when people are freezing in unheated tents after Moria burned down. That's one of many, many other uh, debates going on. The Calais issue, people blocked in the Balkans. And these are very human, very, very crucial and very important problems that are uh, violations of fundamental rights, also including um, core fundamental rights, such as uh, the right not to be subjected to inhuman and degrading treatment. That should be at the core of the EU values and the norms that the EU is supposed to defend. But we are not seeing that the EU is able to react in a proper way. We are pushing money at, at frontline member states. Greece this year uh, received an additional 700,000 uh, or more um, million euros in support also to deal with these problems and many other member states also face uh, these kinds of support and still um, this, this issue are not solved. Uh, and this creates a big problem, that's my last remark, for um, this identity of the EU as a human rights actor internationally. Uh, and that's also uh, to, to look back to the relationship with third countries, blurs completely um, what the EU is supposed to stand for. Uh, we are talking about human rights conditionality in relationship with third states. But uh, as long as the EU behaves as it does, engages in pushback and doesn't solve grave human rights problems, um, it's quite difficult to um, come as a moral actor um, in other parts of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Marie. I think that was uh, already, I, I guess, uh, very, very detailed, uh, very telling in insights uh, into you know, the difference between um, yeah, the uh, rhetoric and practice that we very often, unfortunately, see. And I will probably now also exaggerate it by the headline goals um, and the, the way they are formulated. Um, now, um, without much further ado, let us move on to uh, Manuel Müller. Um, and uh, his contribution to the panel. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm um, 
very honored to to be here and uh, thank you to the to the organizers um, for for having this interesting debate i'm also focusing more on an internal uh, dimension of european values which however um, then has a lot to do with the credibility of uh, the european union's foreign policy when it comes to the rule of law and uh, the rule of law crisis um, which we are seeing in the european union now um, focusing on the Kind of the, the the difference between uh, rhetoric and practice um, that is an interesting um, sentence in the political guidelines by Ursula von der Leyen uh, regarding the rule of law she said there can be no compromise when it comes to defending our core values and uh, my point in a way would be uh, that what we are seeing is that there are compromises in this regard all the time um, of course, um, it should be clear by now that uh, the rule of law is not only endangered, but obviously in a, in a very serious crisis um, in some European member states, mainly Poland and Hungary. Um, and that when the rule of law is uh, in crisis in one of the European member states, it is in crisis in the entire European Union, because as a community of law, the political and legal systems of the European Union member states are interlinked and uh, there cannot be a rule of law in only some member states whereas there isn't rule of law in others. Um, now what we have seen during uh, these, this last year in, uh, in Poland mainly has been an, an open attack to the idea of the community of law um, when the Polish constitutional court simply refused to comply with the ECJ judgment um, regarding the disciplinary chamber which um, the Polish Supreme Court, based on um, a, a previous assessment by the ECJ, um, considered not to be a court at all because it wasn't independent. Um, so um, the the ECJ just um, said that uh, the disciplinary chamber had to stop um, the, the activities. They didn't stop them. Um, and at the same time, there was uh, the famous muscle law um, in which the, the Polish government or parliament um, interdicted um, the, the well, uh, questioning um, the legality of a Polish court um, based on, for example, uh, an ECJ judgment. So there's an, an open contradiction between um, the legal system of uh, ma maintained by the European Court of Justice and the legal system maintained by the uh, Polish Constitutional Court, a situation which is obviously unsustainable and um, in which the Commission would have had to follow up um, by asking the ECJ on a, a, for a penalty um, against Poland. Um, so far, the Commission is still, well, um, considering this move, um, but they haven't uh, made it for over half a year now. Um, and we have seen that the disciplinary chamber in Poland only a few weeks ago um, has um, has made a judgment against a Polish judge, Igor Tuleja, who has lost his immunity and may now be facing jail time, um, essentially because of um, holding up this uh, European, um, well, complying with European law, if you want to put it like that. Um, so we have a, a, a very problematic situation here in which uh, so far the European Union at least hasn't uh, gone all in, um, but is still, well, going for time and seeing whether maybe Poland is going to, to compromise anyway. Um, what uh, the European Commission has started this year is uh, the annual review, um, a rule of law monitoring instrument um, to, to check the situation of the rule of law in all member states, which would have been a great instrument to have 10 or 15 years ago, because of course, um, monitoring of the rule of law situation in itself is a, is a great idea. Um, but it is obviously not enough in the current situation and the way it was announced um, by, by Ursula von der Leyen that this uh, well, sloppy comment that nobody is perfect regarding the rule of law um, was quite a problematic political signal too, in the same way as it was a pol problematic political si uh, signal that uh, both the Council and the Commission hesitated a lot when we saw in this spring the governments of Poland and Hungary abusing the situation of the uh, corona pandemic um, in order to strengthen their own power position um, 
and uh, both the Commission and the Council hesitated to single them out. Uh, they were just talking about, well, we have some problems with some countries, and it took a lot of public pressure and pressure by the European Parliament for the Commission to finally say that um, they were talking about Poland and Hungary, and the Council never indeed um, made clear um, who were the countries um, where were, who were well, abusing the pandemic situation. And finally, we have, of course, uh, the rule of law mechanism for the EU budget, um, which is uh, kind of a, an, an attempt um, to get an instrument with a real grip, um, to um, real have some leverage um, against uh, those governments, as we see that Article 7, uh, which requires unanimity, doesn't work. And uh, there too, we have seen that uh, the council presidency, um, the German government, um, has made compromises, um, that it has moved um, towards um, the position of the Polish and the Hungarian government, um, even when it was clear that in the end they would vote against it anyway. Um, so we made some compromises that weren't even necessary. And we are now in the situation where um, there is a veto by Poland and Hungary, not against the rule of law mechanism, because that doesn't require unanimity, but against the multi-annual financial framework. And uh, while well, we are still hesitating um, to just adopt the rule of law conditionality and then deal with the fallout um, uh, regarding the MFF. Um, uh, and uh, well, the, the last move by the um, Polish um, vice president um, to suggest, uh, he said, binding declaration. Of course, it can't be legally binding, but uh, well, possibly politically binding declaration by the European Council um, not to use the rule of law mechanism in order to defend the rule of law um, would be devastating and um, well, leave us with another politically toothless instrument. Um, so um, there are a lot of compromises and even unnecessary compromises, I would say, um, in a situation where the European Union is really in crisis uh, regarding its uh, internal uh, rule of law and its core values. Um, the EU is not as helpless as it is sometimes portrayed and it is, as it sometimes kind of portrays itself, um, but it needs to take up the confrontation um, with those political actors who are undermining uh, its values. Um, in the end, you can't solve a crisis um, about the core political values uh, by consensus. Um, you can't uh, just uh, deal with those who are attacking the rule of law and hope that they will well, accept some kind of, of compromise um, in order not to do it. And uh, well, while this is, as I said, mainly an, an internal issue, in the end, it goes to the credibility also in uh, foreign politics, and it also goes to the question of values versus interests. Um, because, um, of course, in the moment in which we don't have um, kind of commonly shared uh, political values in the European Union, um, the European Union in global politics um, ceases to be an example uh, regarding values, and it will be seen only as a as a group of interest in a way, um, which will then possibly um, fundamentally damage um, the way how the European Union is seen on the global stage. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, Manuel. I think you touched upon. I think what what is a what is a core um, element? I think in the in the legitimacy of the EU as an international actor. I think if you are not. Uh, you know, living the example that you're prescribing to others, I think then there's, uh, then there's already a, a rather uh, significant problem. And I think we will, we'll, this will come back also in the, in the other presentations to come. Uh, so uh, let me pass then the uh, floor to Alina Vieira, um, who will then, I believe, talk more about the external dimension of foreign policy of European Union. Alina. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So I, I hope I will speak short. It's going to, not going to be long speech, but if it is, please stop me. Uh, I will be talking about the external dimension, as Giselle mentioned. So first of all, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here and an honor to participate in this conference. I think it's uh, also very timely and uh, uh, a very important debate. Uh, I will be talking about external dimension and um, 
so a little bit from a different perspective than my, the, my previous co-panelists. And uh, when we're talking about European Union as a global player, we imply uh, some notion of European Union leadership in the world. And uh, this leadership, I think, is uh, very difficult without any followers. And that would be something that I would like to focus upon today. My main uh, argument would be that the European Union maintains its capacity of influencing other states, but it has to do better in terms of employing this power in particular circumstances. And that uh, speaks uh, a lot into the direction, uh, goes into the direction which uh, my colleague Giselle Bosse already outlined, to what extent can be European Union and this commission can be a geopolitical commission and the European Union a very geopolitical player. And I will start with uh, uh, by saying that I will be focusing on European Union Eastern Partnership as a sort of a, a case, a speci especially crucial case um, of European Union external action because it has to do a lot with European Union credibility. It is a, a region in which a lot of interests coincide, overlap, uh, and I think it's also very important, obviously, by nature, quite naturally, we recognize that there is this. European Union immediate neighborhood, and by uh, this we understand that's a critical important European Union. But on the other hand, we have uh, an overlap of different global power uh, players, uh, which increasingly uh, populate this region. So in addition to Russia, which is quite natural to recognize, we also have China, which becomes more and more important. And then we also have other uh, states which uh, have uh, been very active, Turkey and uh, Iran. And uh, in the midst, midst of everything, we, I think, uh, should be uh, looking at European Union Eastern Partnership region also from this perspective. Uh, Eastern Partnership has its own particular uh, internal problems. Uh, we know a lot about uh, reform process, which is plagued with difficulties. It is a comprehensive uh, systematic transi transition. But if we look at uh, this region from a global perspective, I think it gives us another look, which hopefully will complement the main ideas we discuss in this conference related to autonomy and legitimacy of European Union. So in the midst of Brexit, migration crisis, terrorism attacks of European Union, populism, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we have uh, European Union Eastern Partnership in which European Union is still recognized as a moral power. Um, in European Union Eastern Partnership, we have countries which frame European Union as its civilizational choice. And that's direct quote from the government's representative of um, Georgia and um, Ukraine. Uh, this uh, civilizational choice is defended at the cost of human lives. And the second complementary term, which, which comes associated with this idea of civilizational choice, is irreversibility. So this is something that we will not uh, change uh, in the next government. And as a recognition of that, two countries, Georgia and Ukraine, anchor this. Uh, um, the reversibility in their uh, constitutions. And that is in spite of the fact that China, Russia, Turkey are all presenting their own civilizational alternatives, as we already mentioned. So uh, some of the re emerging or re-emerging global players, they do not reject the universal principles. They do not reject the idea of democracy. They do not reject the idea of human rights or the rule of law, but they insist on their own interpretation of these principles. And uh, this is what uh, is especially clear in the Eastern Partnership region. And in the midst of this, what I believe is very important is there is no other country saying that Russia or China or Turkey is my civilizational choice. We have countries that say that about European Union, this is our civilizational choice. But we do not have any country at the moment that would say that even Russia, who would be the main uh, actor in the region, is uh, our country's civilizational choice. And that is, that this is something that I think should be emphasized. Even countries that are especially close to Russia traditionally, uh, for instance, Armenia or uh, Belarus, both of these countries have traditionally profiled themselves as Russia's closest ally. So we go beyond just general association. They are very hesitant to say that, Europe, that Russia is our civilizational choice. If it is a choice, it is not going to be civilizational. Just yesterday, there is an attempt on the Belarusian ground to uh, register a Russia-oriented uh, civil society organization. And this uh, has been rejected, even though that, that there is, of course, we know that Belarus is just in the, its own deep internal crisis. 
So regardless of the reform performance, uh, this can be state capture in Moldova, that can be reform uh, difficulties in Ukraine and Georgia. Uh, reforms, and that would be my second point uh, related to the idea of social fairness. Um, European Union is still associated with the idea of uh, if you, if we will differentiate another term from the civilizational choice, civilized living. So the model of civilized living and the necessity of reforms which are related to this is another very important source of, if you wish, legitimacy uh, ascribed to European Union and which is missing in other um, uh, centers of power, which kind of influence uh, Europe, the European uh, Union Eastern partners. Um, so by focusing a little bit more and a little bit closer on the issue of credibility, I would like to emphasize the social fairness in the European Union external actions. And in this way, connect us to the previous panel, we were talking about crisis in a, as an opportunity. So in a very different uh, um, sense, COVID-19 has been a crisis which has uh, been an opportunity because in the Europe, for the European Union action throughout 2020, we saw a number of measures. We would hardly think about just one year ago. I, I know it is uh, fair to say that about general uh, action of European Union as such, obviously, but uh, if we consider um, how quickly humanitarian turns into geopolitical, into, in the uh, regional and global affairs. I think it's a, a very important notion to focus, focus upon just for a second. And the fact that European Union uh, provided the emergency support package, uh, the commission actually, the initial COVID-19 emergency support package uh, already in April, this was before it uh, has decided on European Union ounce recovery package has been very significant. I don't, uh, the, um, one of the commission's representatives said, we, I do not remember any, this bureaucratic machine of, um, acting so, so rapidly. So the aid was redirected from the existing program. And that was before uh, European Union actually focused on this macro financial assistance. And that was really very important because in the midst of the disinformation war, which we were living in, the, in April, uh, um, European Union was providing a clear message. I would say it was not emphasized enough and it should have been given more emphasis and more communicational uh, yeah, stress. Um, but uh, it has been able to kind of um, mitigate the first initial buzz uh, related to the fact that COVID-19, a lot of instances came from actually Europe, like for instance, uh, some visitors of Italy uh, coming to Moldova and uh, this uh, recovery package has been really very important. And uh, that is an, an important point in connection with social fairness. Uh, and uh, yeah, I would like to just mention that because I think it's something that we do not often uh, focus upon so much when we look about uh, at, uh, Eastern partnership, we usually focus on the reform process, we focus about particular transitions, corruption, state capture, and so on and so forth. And my last note, since we decided that we are going to speak very briefly, would be as uh, on the European Union as a symbol, I'm originally Belarusian, and at the moment um, uh, we know uh, that uh, what's happening in Belarus, it's not related to the accession perspective at the European Union. European Union flags have not been um, have not been present at the, at the demonstrations. But uh, European Union to the countries in the Central and Eastern Europe, and that was really very clear uh, in the case of Belarus, is still related to this idea of overcoming one repressive authoritarian machine, um, which is directed at an individual. And that's a little bit in an answer to the question, how can a country like Poland, which is surviving its own crisis and uh, uh, has the anti-abortion demonstration going on, at the same time supporting a country like Belarus, because one of the most important bloggers whose name cannot be pronounced in Belarus, as we jokingly say, uh, is resident uh, of the Central Eastern European country. And uh, we, again, have not been, uh, could not have predicted this happening just one year ago. And we could not have predicted certain uh, ideas and measures that uh, are happening right now and events. So for instance, Lithuania discussion on visas for the Belarusians who suffered from repressions. Visas have been often a very uh, problematic issue for the European Union and uh, it is uh, still going on right now. So. Obviously, a lot of interesting uh, debates which reinforce the legitimacy of European Union. 
because uh, when we are talking about European Union legit legitimacy, and that's a very a footnote, of course, I will uh, continue in a second. When we're talking about legitimacy, I would say that there is internal legitimacy my colleagues have been focusing upon when they were speaking about internal legitimacy, but also a sort of relational legitimacy and how, how do we relate to other actors uh, in the region. And um, uh, it's interesting how sometimes we can establish connections and this is happening in the discourse of the Eastern partnership governments uh, to uh, sometimes highlight, sometimes de-emphasize the legitimacy of European Union. But continuing beyond this footnote, I think that's important that, uh, that there were new funds directed at Belarus including scholarship programs at uh, individual member states. There has been a lot of support. And again, uh, probably we would not have been able to imagine it just one year ago. And uh, we were suggested uh, uh, to think a little bit about the contradictions and implications of the ongoing uh, uh, debate on European Union uh, global action. Um, uh, I will just formulate it uh, three and also provide some kind of suggestions. What does the European Union Commission get right? What does it, uh, what could have been done a little better? I thought about three of them. I would say that in terms of Eastern partnerships, there is this understanding of the value of civil society that could not be emphasized enough. Uh, instead of, uh, you know, putting into a closet of long-term thinking and uh, long-term uh, deliberations. Um, and, uh, it would, it would have been a very powerful message if European Union could uh, associate itself with a lot of support initiatives of the civil society in Belarus. Um, the second note uh, would be uh, to protect the, the position in the Eastern Partnership states, because this is exactly the uh, people who have been inspired by what European Union stands for. At this moment, we have 160 political prisons in Belarus. And uh, the, some examples have been very uh, courageous from the European Union, uh, the ambassadors of all European Union delegations have actually united at the uh, Svetlana Alexeyevich house and prevented from him from being, from being arrested. And this was very inspiring to see. Um, but in general, except from, from this uh, ad hoc basis, there should be thinking about how do we respond to cases like poisoning of Alexei Navalny? Uh, how do we uh, respond to, uh, how can we protect uh, features have, have been repressed in countries like Belarus, Azerbaijan, and so on and so forth. And the third note is uh, re re regarding one particular contradiction, it's also the last one. Um, it's uh, how we uh, kind of reconcile the idea of uh, geopolitical uh, action, geopolitical commission, which should be often quick. Uh, and European Union and quick doesn't go very well in the same sentence, uh, but at the same time, you know, uh, do not uh, allow ourselves into this, uh, the overarching resilience narrative. Uh, because resilience is a long-term thinking, it is necessary, but at the same time to act very rapidly, we would need to um, uh, shift our gear, uh, let's, uh, so to say. And uh, I believe there is not too much thinking about, about that going on. It's much easier, it's much comfortable to, un uh, to understand that long-term thinking is involved. And then there are two, you know, buzzwords that allow us very quickly to say that. And I will stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Alena. I'll also immediately pass on uh, the floor to Veronica Junjan, and maybe again with a very uh, polite and gentle reminder to our uh, contributors uh, just to, to stick uh, to, the, to the time frame, because of course we have a very full panel. Um, I, yeah, Veronica. Thank you, Giselle. Um, can you hear me? My, uh... Headset was doing funny things uh, recently. I'm glad to uh, see you again. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you for um, this very, very thought provoking um, debate. I think I will um, put basically two points forward. One uh, would be to call for perhaps a conceptual differentiation between political reforms and administrative reforms. Uh, we've been talking quite uh, extensively, uh, extensively about the internal perspective, the external perspective, but a lot of the discussion of the reforms was focused on the political ones, with good reasons. Um, from, from my side of the screen, um, I would like to call the attention of uh, thinking about administrative reforms. What does it mean EU for its own citizens and for its own uh, role of power as example? It's also basically 
I would dare to say, about what kind of services do we provide to the citizens? I, it, it may come very down to earth and um, it's, it's, for me, it's a call of, of, of moving from say uh, 10,000 meters to um, two meters above the ground. What kind of services do we provide uh, our citizen in order to basically put forward our picture as an EU, which stands for its value? Clear, transparent, accountable, uh, efficient and effective service. Um, that stands also for a definition of the example and the power of the EU, not only internally, but also externally. Um, so in order to do that, what do we need to do? I, I would probably put forward the second point of, of, my, um, of my proposal in order to unite a little bit more the research that's done at 10,000 meter perspective, which is absolutely necessary in order to get the big picture with what is being available and done um, extensively at, um, at the 10 meters above the ground. What kind of service is delivered to the citizens within the borders, across the borders? Um, because that is also when I refer to, uh, to the cross-border cooperation, uh, and to the cooperation, to the example that EU provides for, um, for the countries around. It's an example of how things are delivered in a way that the citizens do expect to be clear, in time, transparent, accountable. Of course, with all the caveats. And that brings me to the third point, that is capacity. Um, more specifically, administrative capacity. Um, I was extremely happy with the point that Alena just made about basically European Commission showing that fast decisions can be done, as in uh, in the first package um, that was uh, that was decided in uh, in April. But then one thing that we often, I argue, forget to take into account is how is that put in practice? How are those billion euros? being administered in order to reach, at the end of the day, um, the business owner around, around the street, uh, the local municipality which organizes its services. Uh, and at the end of the day, how are those billions put to the service of the citizens? So that's my, uh, that's, that was my, my, my third point. I would put forward the proposal to look more closer to what extent European Union at local regional level, that's basically where the rubber hits the road, is able at simply in terms of basic organizational capacity of developing, providing uh, services to the citizen, both within the EU as well as uh, across the border. Um, to, to link back to an example that Marie was uh, provided at the beginning of this session, uh, the implementation of migration uh, policy. In which way are the uh, appropriate uh, national and local level authorities of the EU countries, both the big receivers as well as um, the uh, countries which are at the border of, uh, of the EU, able to cope with a certain level of um, of um, asylum seekers. The example about Lesbos is probably uh, one of the most striking ones, but there are, I would argue, quite a lot of uh, other administrative authorities which do struggle with that. How are they supported or not? What can be done in order to share experiences across the uh, appropriate local, uh, local level? I do remember a series of reports uh, conducted by a fundamental rights agency uh, in the last uh, couple of years, if I were to, uh, to think immediately at the asylum uh, policy. So my point here and is, is to try perhaps to, in a, in a, in a, in a follow-up uh, workshop, uh, consider a little bit more in detail what can be done in terms of um, in terms of the administrative capacity at local level, because I would argue that would be a way to show the strength of the EU. 
EU is a strength, it's a big force when it delivers what it promises, as um, practically all my uh, prior speakers have put forward. But how, what do we need in order to do that? And, and my call perhaps here is to, is to put together, to pull together our uh, common knowledge in order to, uh, to develop uh, solutions for that. I think I would probably stop here because then uh, other questions might, uh, might come later. Thank you so much, uh, Veronica. And I think uh, when I listen very carefully, I hear that, you know, on this continuum from the EU's functional to political to geopolitical engagement, um, that I think there is a, some kind of emerging consensus that what the EU always used to do, which is this more functional, technical, financial uh, engagement uh, with the outside world, is still what they are best at right now. And that's where they can also deliver. Whereas when we then move up from political to geopolitical, um, promises um, get bigger and delivery uh, more difficult. Uh, but let's move on to uh, Ringo uh, Osterwaber. Thank you, Giselle. And uh, I'd like to build on um, the presentations of the other scholars in this panel. I'd like to focus on the issue of the sources of authority for um, uh, the European Union. Um, and my argument is that in the whole history or development of the European Union, um, the protection and the development, the use of its source of authority has always been a key challenge. Uh, I do not, I think that the issue of external audience for the EU's authority is very limited. Uh, perhaps the United States plays a certain role, particularly given that uh, Europe has for a very long time depended on the US for its security but the role of the external audience of Russia, China and Turkey is fairly limited given the despotic character of these states. So they have very, for at least from a European perspective, very limited credibility. Now let me like recall, what is this original source of authority for the European Union, for the European founders? Uh, the issue is that the starting point of a European Union, or at that time a coal and steel community, is Europe's cultural crisis, deeply rooted cultural crisis, nihilism, that is manifested in the totalitarian experience in the Shoah, uh, in persecution, and that comes with issues, the key challenge of that original European Union, how to prevent an, uh, totalitarianism within Europe, how to tame the nation state, how to prevent that the nation state becomes again a barbarous force, and how, connected to that, how to prevent the next world war, how to prevent World War Three? As most of you will know, in the 1940s still, the general expectation was that a World War Three could be taken for granted, and that would have been a nuclear war. Now, these original European founders wanted to preserve Europe in a context in which Europe was destroyed, did not exist, and European culture was gone. So the issue is how to create some space as a source of authority, this civilizational choice, as Alena has called it, space for Europe, given that Europe is squeezed between two world powers, right? the Soviet Union and the United States. Uh, now then we had, and that's the first point, the source of, of the European identity, anti-totalitarian um, and, and, and its source of legitimacy, uh, and that's to be found in the civilizational choice. Second moment is 1973. Uh, that's the moment of the entry of the United Kingdom when the EU or European Economic Community develops its European identity politics. Um, with its declaration on European identity. What's the issue here? The issue is here, how to make sure that Europe does not become a capitalist project. Like given the entry of the United Kingdom, how can we uh, prevent that Anglo-Saxon capitalism becomes a key force that drives the European Union? Um, I would say, in retrospect, the European Union has only mildly managed to avoid becoming a capitalist project. Uh, 
but at least the ambition is there, declaration on the European identity, in which the European values are made explicit, the civilizational choice, as uh, Alena calls it, uh, is made explicit here. Then we have a third moment, and that is the founding of the European Union with the Maastricht Treaty and the corresponding Copenhagen criteria. And here we have a, the, the issue of the return to Europe, as Havel uh, called it. So the integration of Western and Eastern Europe, um, and given that the Central and Eastern Europe had very limited histories of democracy, rule of law, and had a long track record of being conquered by other powers, this was, of course, like a major challenge. Um, but the one European culture, the one civilizational offense, uh, the, the, the one civilizational choice here. Um, but then uh, afterwards, and I would say from the very moment that the European Union was founded, um, the European Union finds itself confronted with European disintegration. Uh, and that's, that's visible. For instance, in the no to the European Constitution in 2004, 2005, that's visible in phenomena like um, Brexit or um, China's um, uh, way in, in the South and Eastern Europe. So the role of, the, of China in preserving these economies, these economies becoming dependent uh, mainly on China more than on West European uh, powers. And what we see here uh, from the 1990s onwards, we see a democratic backsliding. Uh, so we see increasingly a rule of law in crisis, but we also see democracy in crisis. And these are crises from within. And my point is here that the European Union at its very start is an attempt to overcome Europe's cultural crisis up to a point it managed to do so with the Declaration on European Identity, with the founding of the EU. But the past 30 years or so has seen an increasing deepening of Europe's cultural crisis. Uh, and that, that's, up, that, that, that's visible, for instance, among other things, in the rise of nationalist populism. Now, and now come to my, to my real point, and that is uh, the von der Leyen Commission, and in particular, its program of promoting the European way of life, because that is presented again as an attempt to overcome Europe's cultural crisis. There is another program and that is strengthening democracy and that's more specifically uh, targets the problem of populism uh, that on, for various years has been on the European Commission's agenda. But I focus on this promoting the European way of life and this program had, uh, uh, as many of you will know, uh, the, a, a problematic start because it was first called protecting the European way of life, protecting the way of life that comes with an understanding of Europe under threat. Um, so the cultural crisis is not perceived originally with this protecting the European way of life as, as an internal crisis, the problem of Europeans themselves. Um, but it is externalized. The European crisis is externalized. Um, um, and, 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 and where does the threat come from? Eastern Europe, that's one thing. That is something uh, that I think is very interesting. So the threat, the threat to Europe comes from Eastern Europe, like mainly from Hungary and Poland, those who break with rule of law traditions and so forth. That has already been discussed in a previous presentation, but it also comes from the migrants. And that is also something that uh, Marie has uh, pinpointed. So two problems here for the uh, European way of life, the problem of a rule of law and the problem of, of the migrants. Um, but my main issue is the first one, the problem of externalizing the European cultural crisis, holding external stakeholders responsible for Europe's crisis. My second point is a contradiction in this European way of life that Marie has already discussed, so I think I can very shortly mention it, that how is the relationship between the European way of life that's a democratic rule of law based, that's freedom, democracy, justice, 
uh, human dignity, these sorts of values. How does that relate to the phenomenon of fortress Europe? And Lesbos has already been mentioned, but Lesbo Lesbos follows a certain concentration camp logic, right? It's the camp logic in which we find the destruction of all European values. We find a destruction of humanity here. Um, so here we have a betrayal of this European way of life, a betrayal of European values. My third point that I wish uh, to mention is the problem that this European way of life having become a policy program, right? This is a policy program, 2019, 2024. And uh, one of the problematics is that European values become problematized here. Values become policy instruments devoid of their cultural uh, substance. And, and why is that? That is to reify what counts as a European way of life on the one hand, and what is a non-European or an anti-European way of life on the other hand. So the issue is, who are the real Europeans here? What counts, what is included in this European way of life? and what is excluded, it's reified. It's a fixated uh, uh, way of life, a fixated European identity. But as we, we all know, the European identity and how Europe uh, has developed is as an open dynamic space, some would say migrant space. And I'd like to mention that Europe is originally Phoenician, right? It, has, it was born in, in Lebanon um, originally. Yet, I'd also like to mention that this um, European way of life also has some good points uh, and has some, some understanding, as mild as it is, uh, of, of recognizing what the European cultural crisis consists of, this European nihilism, and provides some way of overcoming the cultural crisis. For instance, Commissioner Skinas mentions that um, issues of European integrations require a fundamental reframing uh, in terms of the embodiment of the European way of life. And I think that's, that, that, that's a good starting point, that European integration implies the embodiment of European values, the embodiment, the manifestation of a European identity. And the second point that I'd like to mention that I think is a, um, another point that enables us to take this European policy uh, uh, of uh, the European way of life uh, seriously is that Skinas, the commissioner responsible for this program, stresses that ultimately this European way of life is a question of mindset. Um, so it comes up with opening up mental borders between we and them. Uh, and that means that there is a recognition that this European cultural crisis is both an intellectual and a moral crisis. And to be able to overcome that, we have to work with the mind. Um, and that recognition that is explicitly articulated by Skinas, I think is a good starting point of, of recognizing the, the complexity of the issue at stake here. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, I think this is. I think it's an, an awful lot of value, also in terms of the yeah, looking at this from a, from a more historical perspective, but also bringing in uh, this other, indeed, very dominant uh, guideline or uh, guide. Uh, the headline goal by the EU on the European way of life and that also shows how interconnected again the uh, internal and also external dimensions are and how deep and cultural um, they are too uh, in this European project. Um, let, then, uh, let us final, finish with um, Julian um, Romanishin um, who will uh, also be the last contributor to this panel and I have the feeling that we will be slightly uh, ever so slightly, perhaps a few minutes uh, over over time, but uh, hopefully um, you will grant Julian the time that uh, also his presentation uh, deserves. Uh, Julian, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Do you hear me well? Okay, perfect. Um, thank you so much, Zil, for uh, for the introduction and many thanks for the organizers and for, to Chernobyl Prize Academy for inviting me. Um, uh, in my remarks, I will, I'll be focusing on uh, uh, on the Alliance Commission as well as uh, the Juncker's Commission, and um, I want to start with, a, with an observation uh, related to uh, comparison uh, 
how the, the headline goal of Europe in the world you know, framed in both documents. And I think one can see um, that um, the, the, the headline goal in the borderline description of political priorities um, actually appears to have um, more nuanced presentation, I would say, and, and more substance if one compares it to the Juncker's document. So um, instead of, um, for example, giving out this long, never ending list of geographical priorities, uh, the headline goal singles out three regions. That is uh, Africa, Western Balkans, and the post post Brexit United United Kingdom. That is that should be priority for the EU. Uh, it has more positive language with regard to EU enlargement. Um, and um, uh, I remember that the EU started this term announcing that there will be no enlargement, and then they essentially the EU will be inward looking during his uh, period in, in uh, as president. And it has some quite several very specific proposals like uh, introducing qualified majority voting uh, in foreign and security policy, um, introducing this post of chief uh, trade um, enforcement officer that uh, Juncker's document uh, uh, was lacking. So I think it's on, on uh, well, this on the paper, the, the, the headline goal uh, sounds quite good. So within this headline goal, I was I, I, I want to highlight one sub priority uh, which I'm working on as a fellow of the Money Prize Academy, um, and that is uh, security and defense. Um, so this is an area um, that traditionally has been viewed as least promising in uh, uh, area of European integration, but today it seems to be uh, increasingly well tied to the success of the entire European project in, in the 21st century. It is also an area that, that enjoys a very high uh, public support. So three quarters of Europeans, according to opinion polls, uh, favor uh, support common policy in this area. And this, this public support has been very constant uh, about 70% since 1999. So very quickly, uh, due to time constraints, um, uh, on the positive side, um, a lot has been achieved in this area in the last five to six years with direct involvement of the European Commission. Um, its, its signature achievement, uh, I would say, was the launch of the European Defense Fund proposed by, by Juncker himself in 2016. Um, that aims at, uh, first of all, boosting uh, defense research in Europe, but also at supporting the uh, transnational collaborative uh, development of defense capabilities. The uh, Commission was also very much involved into uh, uh, pushing the activation of um, what uh, Martin Selmayr, uh, um, the, the Chief of Staff of, Commi of Juncker uh, Commission, called the Sleeping Beauty of the Lisbon Treaty, uh, that is the clause of uh, permanent structure cooperation in defense. Um, and that is uh, and PESCO. And PESCO has been seen, uh, widely seen as a watershed moment for uh, achieving European strategic autonomy in security and defense. So by, by laying out those financial incentives and, and institutional mechanisms, by putting them on the table, uh, the Commission actually firmly established itself as a, as a security player and um, contributed to uh, laying the foundation of more systematic um, defense cooperation among uh, EU member states. Now, uh, on the other hand, we also witnessed uh, some worrying trends. Um, uh, we've seen over the course of the last year that uh, defense has become one of the victims of COVID-19. Um, and many uh, commentators and observers that were working in this area had some sense of deja vu uh, of what had, ha what had happened 10 years ago uh, when in the, after, uh, in the decade, in the aftermath of financial economic crisis, because of significant defense uh, cuts, uh, cuts in defense budget, member states uh, lost lion's share of the, their defense capabilities. Again, a similar story happened here during the negotiations of, uh, of, the, of the budget over the summer when European Defense Fund was cut uh, significantly from 13 billion euros to 7 billion euros. 40% cut um, the, uh, the military mobility project that is the flagship project uh, uh, of EU cooperation with NATO has been sliced as well. The same story with European peace uh, facility. Um, so, of course, money is not everything, uh, but um, it's it, it's hard to be a credible uh, security provider and global leader if you don't put money where your mouth is. Um, so obviously, COVID-19 has overwhelmed uh, 
underlines uh, first year uh, in the office. Um, and of course, also it's about member states, member states, and then decide on the budget. But it's um, it's it's a little uh, disappointing to see that that happened on von der Leyen's watch, uh, especially given uh, uh, the fact that that that, that she was she, that she held the defense portfolio um, in her national capacity before uh, uh, taking the office in Brussels. So one would my, one would expect a bit more forceful uh, position of commission uh, in those negotiations. Um, and, and, and this leads to, uh, to the second point, actually, to what extent security and defense remains a priority for, for, for this commission. Um, it seems to be slipping away from the commission's agenda. Again, um, it, it defense has not been mentioned at all during the on the lines for uh, first state of the union address in September. There was no substantial effort to defense in the focus report uh, that has been published three days ago, the first year uh, focus report. Um, so that, that, that's concerning, and um, uh, but I think it is it would be very important to uh, in the years to come uh, not to lose the momentum, uh, not to lose the momentum that uh, what has been uh, what has been achieved in the last five years. Again, the COVID nineteen pandemic doesn't diminish the security risks and threats that the EU is facing; it actually amplifies them. Many agree with on that, and um, even though. Um, uh, and it's also very clear that even when with the new administration in the White House uh, that has a very different approach and view of the European Union and, 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 and very eager to uh, update and upgrade the transatlantic relations, even with the Biden administration, Europeans will still be expected to step up the efforts uh, to get, carry a uh, greater share of the burden, uh, the transatlantic burden, and to do more um, uh, to defend themselves. So there is still a lot of work to uh, to be done in the years to come. I'll stop here. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Julian. Uh, thank you also uh, to everyone for just granting these two additional uh, minutes. I think we would then uh, close this panel. I saw that there were a lot of questions, though. Some are already being answered by um, the panelists, but I would perhaps then ask Serena to uh, copy these questions or keep the questions so that we're not going to lose them and then invite everyone to join us to the breakout room um, and that we can just simply continue uh, the discussion and uh, answer the questions and perhaps um, develop some of the uh, issues that were raised uh, now in this very interesting contributions um, a little bit uh, further. So uh, therefore, I would first of all thank, yeah, like to thank everyone uh, in this panel for these very interesting, I think also very diverse, uh, but in, in many ways complementary um, uh, contributions. Um, and uh, yeah, and I hope that we can continue um, the conversation uh, after I believe, I think in the thematic breakout rooms, which starts at three o'clock. And I pass back the floor to Christine or the organizers in case we need to know the practicalities of the lunch break. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, I have nothing to say about the lunch. We will have to organize that uh, ourselves, but we will come back um, for, for another uh, panel at uh, 1.30 on sustainable and green Europe. And then we will also um, divide ourselves into breakout groups. Some of you have already signed up for the breakout groups, some of you have not. So we have now sent you a very logistical message, Campus Brussels has done so, a very logistical message how you can assign yourself uh, to breakout groups. You can either do that uh, in your name you, uh, or um, reply to the chat or send uh, an email. So there are different options. And after lunch, we will then have the panel and then the breakout groups. And we really would like a lot of um, discussion in these groups because we had to cut the discussion short now. So thank you so much for the uh, panel that we just had. It was very, very interesting. Again, I learned a lot. And now we go for lunch and come back at 1.30. Bon appétit.
Okay, welcome back. I hope you all had a good lunch break. As said before, it's a pity we couldn't have that uh, together. Hopefully better times will come when we can do that again and don't have to cook quickly in between. So we now have um, a third panel. And again, we have combined topics that are actually difficult to combine, but at the same time, um, at the same time, it makes sense because all of these priorities of the Commission are actually cross-cutting and uh, touch upon a lot of issues, and we already discussed that uh, this morning. So the third panel will focus on a sustainable and green Europe, and one that is fit for a digital age. And it will be chaired also by my colleague, uh, Darian Meacham, who is assist, he's now associate professor, associate professor of philosophy at Maastricht uh, University, and he's principal investigator, and that's why we also asked him to chair this panel for the Brightlands Institute for Smart Services and Society. And in between the lunch break, we got a message that unfortunately, Tobias Ernst, who is the chief executive officer at Kieran Education, uh, has fallen ill. Uh, he was here this morning, but he felt very dizzy, and so he excuses uh, himself. So um, if you hear that, Tobias, we of course hope that you get well very soon. Um, so we then uh, have three speakers. Um, we will see if we will end a little bit earlier with this panel um, and then immediately go to our breakout rooms after break, of course. But we'll see how it goes. And I'm already talking too much, so I will give the floor to Darian. Thank you so much, Christine, and welcome to our third panel of the day. So as we have three, we have four excellent experts lined up. Unfortunately, Tobias is feeling ill and can't make it. So we have four or three excellent experts here today to discuss two small issues. Just kidding, they're huge, huge issues. So digitalization or the creation of a Europe fit for a digital age and of course, addressing climate change through the European Green Deal. Uh, and these two policy priorities are very closely related uh, to the topic of our previous panels, actually. So making the, the EU more democratic and more socially fair and promoting EU values and assuming global leadership. As we know, the green and digital transitions cannot be discussed without taking into account questions about European democracy, the social question, and also the broader geopolitical context. So I will introduce our panelists in a moment, but first let me say a brief opening word about these two European policy priorities, their close relationship to one another, and just some of the challenges, because there are a lot of challenges, but some of the challenges for uh, facing their, their implementation. So these two policy priorities not only confront two of the most pressing global challenges we face today, the European Commission president has called the Green Deal Europe's man on the moon moment, but these two are also deeply, deeply interlinked. And to quote the Green Deal communication that was published nearly, nearly a year ago, Europe must leverage the potential of the digital transformation, which is a key enabler for reaching the Green Deal objectives. So these two are deeply, deeply and closely tied to one another in the thinking of the European Commission. Reaching the aims set by the proposals in the Green Deal, so the biggest aim being EU climate neutrality by 2050, that's the main, that's the main objective, will, by the Commission's account, involve the development of and also the application of far-reaching data collection, analysis, and data sharing techniques. And this will have to be done in ways that are also privacy preserving, that are compliant with European data protection regulations that are supportive of the aim of European data sovereignty and that facilitate a just, that word is going to be coming up a lot, a just green and digital transition. So of course, there's also a flip side to this complementarity between the Green Deal and Europe's digital coming of age. And that's that emissions from data processing and storage are set to rise, just as this data processing and storage is essential to meeting targets for reducing emissions. So this is one of the many challenges that this policy marriage of the Green Deal and Digital Europe will have to face. 
Both policy initiatives, both policy priorities are also described as engines for growth in the EU 27. The green transition is hoped, indeed promised, to bring jobs in all related policy areas. Likewise, Europe's digital sector is seen as a growth area in the coming decade. And just two days ago, the European Commission President told the Lisbon Web Summit that the European digital sector was still punching below its weight and that it could expect to receive something in the region of 150 billion euros of public investment in the next generation EU recovery plan. It's undoubtedly hoped that the investment will create high skilled jobs as well as high skilled infrastructure. Again, there is a flip side. The anticipated political obstacles to the Green Deal will largely come from the disruption of established national industries and the fear of job losses. Franz Timmermans has said that there will be a just transition or there will be no transition at all. The distribution of the risks and the benefits of the enormous transition applied, implied by the Green Deal's goals is one of the tasks facing European policymakers, but also civil partners and civic society in the years and decades ahead. The question of what member states and what societal groups will bear the costs of the Green Deal policies will be one of the fiercest debates. Of course, the costs of inaction are practically unthinkable. The commission funded coach project has estimated that sea level rise will cost Europe 135 billion to 145 billion per year by the 2050s. And this is to say nothing of the costs that are not so easily quantified. The just transition mechanism is currently foreseen to provide targeted support to help mobilize at least 150 billion over the period of 2021 to 2027 in the most affected regions. The aim of this is to alleviate the social and economic impact of the transition. And again, these questions of European values and European solidarity that we have discussed in the first two panels will raise their heads here. Likewise, the digital transition brings with it the specter of task, role, and job automation. And with it, potential polarization of the labor market that may also spur social and political polarization and a skills gap in the labor market. Again, this is a challenge that is inextricably linked, that these inextricably linked policy initiatives will have to face. And then of course, there's the elephant in the room that also threatens to shake the close alignment of the Green Deal and the plan for a digital Europe. There is evidence that the COVID crisis has refocused the attention of member state publics away from the threat of climate change. And some European politicians already wary of the Green Deal for various reasons have taken the opportunity to suggest a pause or even a discontinuation of the plan. The Green Deal, if it is to succeed, will have to touch every aspect of our economy and of our lives. Power production and transportation account for the biggest chunk of emissions, but industry, construction, residential fuel use and agriculture all also make significant contributions. It will require a legislative firestorm, as the newspaper Politico recently put it. Its aims, if realized, will dramatically transform Europe's economy and society. I briefly give you a run through of these aims because it's, it's worthwhile to mention them to understand just how broad and far reaching they are. Supplying clean and affordable and secure energy. Mobilizing industry for a clean and circular economy. Building and renovating in an energy and resource efficient way. Accelerating the shift to sustainable and smart mobility. From farm to fork, designing a fair, healthy and environmentally friendly food system. Preserving and restoring ecosystems and biodiversity and a zero pollution ambition for a toxic free environment. You can see the scale of this project, the scale of this initiative is indeed enormous. Digital transformation also, in fact, already touches nearly every aspect of our lives. And here it's not so much a question of initiating, but of guiding, controlling, regulating, and ensuring a transition that is in line with European values and interests. The challenges of both and 
of their intertwining will shape European policy and life in ways that we do not yet fully understand. We wanna talk about all of this, but we also wanna think about the role of societal partners and actors, civil society and the broader geopolitical scene in the debates and legislative developments around these two policy priorities. So there's no small task for our distinguished panelists to, to address here. The, the scope, let's say, is, is enormous. Um, and I'll go right ahead and introduce them. Nathalie Blanc is the director of the Centre de Politique de la Terre, which is a collaboration between the University of Paris and Sciences Po. She's also a director of research for the CNRS. There she is appearing on my, appearing. People just sort of magically appear on our screens. It's a there, just hi Nathalie. Fotini Vriki is a lecturer in digital media and culture at King's College London. Hello, welcome. And Seren Pekdemir is assistant professor at the International Center for Integrated Assessment and Sustainable Development. That's the ICIS at Maastricht University. Hello, Sven, great to see you. So a well, big, very, very warm welcome to you three and very sad that Tobias cannot be here to, to join us. Um, I invite each of you, <clears throat> you know the drill I think by now, right? So I invite each of you uh, to give a brief introduction to your, to your views on the topic and then we'll get the discussion started with some opening questions and then we'll open the floor to questions from the, from the audience which are being gathered together in the, in the chat. Um, and in the meantime, this is the digital transition, but we know it's gonna be a rough one. So I hope everyone's internet connection holds up uh, during, during our panel. And Natalie, I will pass, as Christine Nice says, I pass the screen directly to you. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. This is a great opportunity for me to speak about the Green Deal. So thank you everyone for inviting me. Well, as an introduction, I will, as a geographer, because Diane didn't introduce me properly, I think. I mean, I, I need to repeat that I am a geographer, meaning that I, that, I, that I care about territories, which is a very French term, I guess, but it has some translation in other language. So I think it's an important issue in terms of Green Deal, how we deal with territories and what is the matter with them regarding all uh, environmental issues. Uh, I will say just in introduction that the, the, the IPCC focused one of its last report about land use. And I think land use may be an integrated answer to climate change. And it is taken as such by the IPCC. And land use is very much connected to the way we use territories and the way we uh, manage them in terms of policy making. So this is what I will focus on. I don't know if it's enough as an introduction, but I felt it introduced my talk somehow. Thank you so much, Natalie, and I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mention that you are also a, a geographer. Well, Do you want, we, we have lots of, we have a little bit extra time as, as you know. So if you want to continue to say something else about the importance uh, of land use um, in our discussions of the, of the Green Deal, I think now would be, or we can return to it again in okay. the- Okay, I, I may say that it is of importance in, in diverse way. It is important in terms of social issues because people do relate to territories. I mean, they live somewhere in some place in some times with some people and we have to connect in to ways of living at different scales. I mean, it is very important, especially because mobility is part of the, of the new green deal somehow. It is important also because how we going to, to, to use the land is related to biodiversity erosion in diverse country. Most of our countries in Europe have reached like 80% of urbanization. So we're not going to change much about that, except if people feel like they have to flee uh, cities and go back to countryside, which may mean in terms of mobility, other problems. So we have to 
relate to land use regarding biodiversity issues. It is a solution in terms of climate change also, because the more we plant, the more vegetation we have at the, on, on the land, in the landscape, the more carbon capture it can hold, I mean, somehow. So we have to reflect upon them. It is also important in terms of urbanization, because right now, especially in France, every year, uh, I mean, it's like the whole department, a whole territory, which is swallowed by urbanization. So this is why land use, I feel, is very important. Excellent. Thank you so much, Natalie. Well, I think we'll return to many of those things that you, those topics that you just mentioned. Um, so, and I want to pass the, the screen directly to, directly to you now. Um, it's yours. All right. Thank you, Darian. I also need to make a minor correction on what you said during the introduction, and it relates to where I work. Um, uh, we had a transition in a name, so it's now Maastricht Sustainability, where I work, um, Maastricht Sustainability Institute, where I work, but I do exactly the same work as I did a year ago, so um, nothing in uh, difference there. But I'm very pleased to be part of this panel, in which I will also specifically want to chip in on how we can get to a sustainable and to a green Europe. And I think we really live in an exceptional time with the European Green Deal embodying a project that is really ambitious on many fronts. There are various policy areas, of course, that the Green Deal focuses on. And Darian, you explained them rather well uh, in your introduction, um, where there's a focus on um, clean energy, sustainable mobility, agriculture, sustainable agriculture, and so forth. And so there are many reasons why we can say that the Green Deal in Europe, and also the world, but in Europe is necessary, including serious existential threats, of course, and the coupling of a sustainability agenda to the social and economic well being of European citizens. Now, I think that's really nothing that any one of us really fundamentally can disagree with. So, uh, the European Commission has drafted a plan to overcome the challenges that we have and has explicitly formulated a growth strategy that will transform the EU into a so-called modern, resource efficient and competitive economy. And here I sum up from uh, the document uh, that there are no net emissions of greenhouse gases by 2050, that economic growth is decoupled from resource use and no person and no place is left behind. And I further just briefly continue to read. The European Green Deal is the plan to make the EU's economy sustainable. This needs to be done by turning climate and environmental challenges into opportunities and making the transition just and inclusive for all. Now, if I reflect on this, um, by looking at the plan, which is a document uh, that is 24 pages long and was communicated slightly less than a year ago, then as a scholar working in the field of governance for sustainable development, um, several observations arise. Now the view on sustainability as it is projected in the document is very anthropocentric. One in which human beings are really central to the text and the assessments of the challenges that are ahead are exclusively formulated from a human perspective. Now, from a policy formulation viewpoint, one in which the plan relates specifically to economic activity and human flourishing or survival, if you will, this may not be surprising. But from a sustainability perspective, it is certainly remarkable that the value of nature and the value of animals and their well being is not evident beyond the ecosystem services view in which the benefits of the natural environment are considered to benefit humans and human activity primarily and solely actually. So coupled to that is the plans are expressed, uh, the way in which they are expressed are subservient to the principles of economic growth. Now from a political strategy point of view, I get that, but it needs to be said because there's of course 
quite a big narrative also on degrowth de from a sustainability perspective. So um, what I want to basically throw into the group is, will the European narrative e eventually be that we cared for the sake of ourselves, that we try to reach our own targets, sometimes clearly by outsourcing environmental damage and displacing the effects and the costs to other parts of the world. Because we might say that biodiversity, for instance, is important and plant forests in Europe. But if through our production and consumption patterns, we continue to deforest important areas on the other side of the planet, then clearly from a sustainability perspective, uh, from a holistic perspective, we would be doing something wrong. So the narrative is important also in terms of what it is, uh, what we value. So now let me be very clear about my position. I think the European Union is really about to embark on many changes that will be for the benefit of us uh, as Europeans and hopefully for the rest of the world as well. So we, I think we are really being in a leadership position there. However, while many of the strategies are being developed as we speak and become more and more concrete in the years that will follow, I think that for a just and an inclusive transition, we need to pay more attention to those who do not have a voice, including nature and animals. Thank you so much for that. So again, lots of points for us to, for us to take up in the, in the discussion. Uh, Putini, you're here from a slightly different from a slightly different perspective, I think. So you're here to discuss with us also the digital transition and the idea of Europe fit for a, for a digital age. Um, so I pass the the screen to you. Thank you so much, uh, Darian. Um, uh, thanks so much. So. I think um, I completely agree with both uh, Natalie and Seren. Um, we have big challenges coming up uh, in Europe right now uh, in the upcoming years. Um, and uh, Europe is facing this uh, digital transformation uh, to create technology um, fit for people and not the other way around. And that is people adjusting to technology, uh, which has been the norm in the past decade, I would say. Uh, so this is differs a bit to what Seren has been talking about, um, the human-centric or anthropocentric uh, discussions that we have about the Green Deal um, fit much better when we're discussing the digital transformation um, of Europe uh, because technology has never been or has partly been uh, centering humans. Uh, it has been centering corporations and um, capital and so forth. So um, I think the three kind of more important aspects of this transformation, uh, the digital transformation of Europe uh, should be firstly protecting the lives and the livelihoods of people in uh, the EU and beyond that. Um, definitely ensuring the green growth, the technology development and the green deal work uh, hand by hand and basically accelerating um, and Europe's digital transformation to create this competitive market uh, that they are envisioning as the, data, the new data economy or the digital economy, um, as it's being discussed in this digital strategy uh, that the EU has put forward. So uh, basically making tech fit for its people um, that I'm, I'm kind of advocating here is um, firstly and foremost uh, recognizing um, Europe's role in leading the way to solving global issues such as the climate change and the impact that we've had on, on, on our planet. Um, and secondly, require, it requires some um, addressing um, the concerns behind uh, calls for Europe to be more sovereign. So getting uh, control over its, uh, its technology, its data, uh, what goes beyond our borders. And finally, it is about supporting Europe uh, with leveraging the opportunities and addressing the challenges of digital transformation, uh, particularly in the wake of this uh, COVID-19 crisis um, that we've been experiencing in the past year. And as you said at the beginning, Darian, about using this uh, word on the just and responsible technology that we are so much pushing forward right now is at the center of this digital transformation. 
So going back to the first point that I made about uh, tech for skills um, and jobs, and uh, this again feeds back to the crisis that we're having now with COVID-19, with people losing their jobs, um, trying to reskill and gain new opportunities in the job market. Uh, definitely te technology and this digital transformation will need to focus uh, on supporting these people uh, that have been impacted by the pandemic uh, to enter this uh, labor market that is new to them or they may partially know about it. So we need to equip these people with digital skills, uh, data skills, uh, and that links back to the discussions we, we've uh, been having about data and digital literacy at the beginning in, in this kind of um, uh, conference. Uh, the second point uh, that I made about um, the tech for green growth obviously fits a lot with what uh, Natalie and uh, Saren have been talking about, so I'm not going to uh, elaborate on it, but um, what I want to say again is that uh, it's a top priority to uh, make sure that technology that this development of technology that we're envisioning uh, will have the planet uh, as a priority and that we protect the planet um, is essential. So we shouldn't go into developing technology without considering the impact that this development is going to have uh, on our planet and on our climate. And finally, my the final point that I want to make is about uh, inclusive technology and the and how this digital transformation that we will be experiencing and we are currently in experiencing has to put people who have been disadvantaged at the center of it. So we have to in increase digital inclusion um, in in aspects such as from students and employees in, in rural areas we, who are unable to study or work from home uh, due to limited connectivity. Uh, we need to think about people with disabilities or the elderly who are limited in their use of technology. And that's going to help us overcome so social isolation uh, that the pan pandemic has basically highlighted uh, um, as a more kind of pronounced digital divide. Um, and we can really not ignore it. Uh, we have the evidence right now through the pandemic. We know that this technology has to help people who live on the margins of technology. So we should be using technology to basically help um, bridge this divide. And this can be in the form of, uh, we can think about free broadband. Uh, we can create technology that is based on the foundations of accessibility. Um, and the main thing that I'm actually looking at right now um, is the development of these new European data spaces, which will provide a wider access to data. Um, and the plan is to contribute to Europe's digital transformation efforts by helping organizations of all sizes uh, realize the benefits of data and at the same time teaching citizens, European citizens, on, how, on learning about how you use data and digital technologies um, and what are the benefits and the drawbacks of these technologies. Thanks to all three of you. Those are three really excellent introductions with quite a bit of quite a bit of uh, quite a few questions and quite a few issues for us to for us to continue on. The, the first thing I want to I want to touch upon it's something that I think all three of you mentioned in your introductory introductory talks. So I want to give you a little bit of a chance to to expand upon it, um, and that's the relationship between let's say, the Green Deal on the one hand and growth, and also the relationship between uh, Europe fit for a digital age um, and the question of economic growth, and then how that loops back, of course, to the question of the Green Deal and how the development of digital technologies are apparently so central to the implementation. Of the Green Deal, um, and I, I mean, I can I can ask you the question. I think very bluntly. I mean, it's a night. Of course, we always want to say yes. This is going to bring growth, and we still seem to function in this kind of growth paradigm where economic growth is seen to be the let's say the the political. Uh, I don't want to say be all end all, but let's say something along something along those. It's still something along those lines. Are the goals of the Green Deal? Are the aims, are its aspirations compatible with the continued agenda for economic growth? Or do we have to fundamentally rethink the way that these two are related? Do we have to rethink the growth side of the, of the, of the equation? 
what's the, so that's a pretty open uh, starter question for you. Uh, and Natalie, uh, if, you, I, if you don't mind, I let you uh, take the screen again and give us some insights there. Well, thank you for the question. I think it is a very provoking one. I mean, in some ways, I think rather than growth, I would talk about justice, you know, and it relates to uh, what my previous, uh, what the previous speaker has said about it. Should we take a, into account like animal lives, plant lives, biodiversity lives? Does it, I mean, do, should we think about growth when we think of them and including them in whatever green deal we're going to talk about? I mean, it is very important to say that whatever growth we could think of, it should involve and include all these living things or living beings and living, I mean, what support us in terms of horizon and living also. So I think it's not a growth anymore. It should be spoken as a way to sustain our lives in, a, in, a, in, in space and in time uh, in a, the more just way. I mean, I, I don't know how to think it. I mean, it's very difficult. It's a global justice frame which involves time and space. I mean, uh, so, well, I guess I am not in the growth modern uh, talk thing. <laughs> Perhaps one of the other speakers should. Yeah, sure. I, I'm happy to continue. I completely agree with you um, on that. I think uh, if we think of the term justice, that would do it more justice um, because clearly we need to continue and clearly we need to go ahead and transform our societies. And I think part of that transformation is eventually also really having an honest uh, conversation about whether growth should be necessary to achieve the outcomes that we want. Um, I, think it's, uh, I think the term is very loaded. I think it really fits within, let's say, um, the discourse, the liberal democratic discourse uh, that is of course underpinning uh, the European Union in many regards. Uh, so to a certain extent, we, we, we shouldn't escape that discussion as well. Um, uh, and we have to think of possibilities and action plans that do not necessarily suffer from the fact that growth in certain areas will not continue. Um, and I think the foundational basis for that can be found in the document itself, for instance, in the Green Deal. I think, I think there is uh, definitely um, like a, a, a space for that conversation to happen and to focus on areas that uh, can provide us with the necessary, uh, yeah, basically the energy that we need and the foods that we need for consumption and these sorts of things. But we shouldn't shy away. I think that's my main message um, from this discussion with others. Martine, do you want to add something to this, to this point? So just one simple point, I think uh, Sarin just covered most of it and Natalie as well, but um, I think we should go beyond talking about the trendy top trending like topics like, such as like degrowth and thinking about what actually this means uh, in practical uh, um, in, in, in practice. So what are we thinking when we're talking about degrowth? Are we thinking of stopping the development of technology or are we thinking of changing uh, the ways in which we work as societies, uh, as economies? How can we link back this idea of growth in a ways that is basically more trust, creating this more trust between societies, between obviously member states in the European Union, um, which I actually want to talk a bit about when it comes to um, these discussions about growth, because we have so many disparities and gaps between how member states um, look at this growth and some member states need the growth and some others have been taking over a lot of these discussions about growth and have grown themselves in much faster um, ways than other member states and how can we balance out this growth around the European Union.
Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a extremely important point. I mean, all, all of us or all of you have mentioned this shift in thinking about growth to thinking about justice. And of course that also entails thinking about where growth might still be necessary and where and where it's not necessary as well. So fantastic point, thank you so much. Um, so then I, I wanna come back to something that you said. So I, I, I'm a philosopher, so I take my seat of, well, my sort of my, my chairing role here and I take advantage of it a little bit to ask you a philosophical question, I think. I mean, you mentioned this idea of valuing uh, let's nature, valuing parts of nature, valuing animal life, valuing plant life, valuing the ecosystem beyond its relation to us or beyond its instrumental function function for us. And you mentioned that when you when you read the Green Deal documentation, when you look at this communication published nearly a year ago, you still see it in in this in this vein or in this let's say paradigm of the the. The natural world has value insofar of its insofar as it's valuable for us. Can you say a little bit something more about how we shift away from thinking about that? Uh, what does it mean to value the natural world, to value animal and plant life in itself, without without its thinking about its relationship to us? Sure. Um, um, it's indeed quite a philosophical question, and maybe uh, something that not everyone is. Uh, uh, accustomed to as well. Uh, but I think it has to do a lot of uh, with respect, uh, respect of um, um, that one can be on this planet and that also one can respect that others inhabit this planet. And of course, um, uh, we know that uh, humans have, um, with this, the whole Anthropocene have dominated nature. Uh, for quite a long time. And uh, so we have become very good at thinking about uh, nature and our surroundings as something that we can dominate, that we can completely mold to our likings and our benefits and our needs uh, and so forth. So what does it really mean um, to value nature in itself? I think for me personally, it has to do with respecting the fact um, that we are not here alone as a species uh, and that um, that there are many organisms and uh, animals that are alive and breathe and who have just as much right to be here as us. And I think where I see particularly how we are detached from some of that, um, and I, I really see also a counter movement going on, by the way, also, I mean, it has always existed to some extent, uh, with, for instance, alternative farming, alternative lifestyles, these sorts of things. But I also see it in the newer generations, uh, the younger generations and the students that we have. So this is something that students and especially with uh, the marches on climate justice, I think um, that a lot of students and young people do see the value of nature and these sorts of things. And so what sort of um, strikes me is that when we look at these plans, that, that there's no explicit mentioning of that. So, uh, so the respect that we have, and I think uh, a, a colleague of mine, Pim Martins, he also poses this question and he says basically, so imagine you know, if we were to fail even in our plans to <laughs> save the planet and save ourselves, it, if we don't even come to that, will we have also failed to say that we value nature and animals? Um, and, I, and I think this is a very profound sort of statement in that regard. I think, I think on the basic level, we should be able to say that. And yeah, I, I certainly can. Thank you. Natalie, I, I want to ask you the same question. Um, and also then I want to try to link it to something that you said during your, your introduction. So in your introduction, you mentioned uh, ways of living at different at different scales, um, and I wonder if you if you can connect or if there is a connection between this idea, especially of this of different scales and what that means, to what Sarah is just talking about in relation to having a different type of respect for nature and for let's say the the natural world that goes beyond its instrumental value for for us. Well, I should say that my PhD was about nature in cities and especially about animal lives in cities. 
And if I go more in details, I would say that I worked on cockroaches in cities and how much we should respect them as proof that cities are also living environments. So it raises a lot of philosophical question about animal lives, especially when you work on insects, for example. Uh, that's what I do right now in Paris, because uh, Paris, uh, the city of Paris has a policy about um, uh, removing uh, the paving of uh, the soil. How do you call it? I can't remember. Whatever, in order for children in, in, uh, in uh, high school, in schools, to see the ground, the real one, and uh, also to be connected to nature. So it raises many questions because if you talk about nature in general, like you did and like many philosophers do, I mean, it, it is easy, but if you talk, for example, about cockroaches in cities of flies or insects, I mean, we have all kinds of other problems and respect is one of them. I mean, I should, you know, raise this issue. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to uh, learn how to live with the natural world. We still don't know. It's not only a matter of respect, it's a matter of learning. I mean, it's like, and while we learning, like 80% of biodiversity is just disappearing. So in 20 years or even in some years, I mean, we won't have to learn anymore because there won't be any more insects to learn after. I, 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 I'm not going to, to deep into that, but I know that human beings do adapt very quickly to new situation and forget about the previous one. So they won't remember what it means to live with insects, uh, but they will learn other ways to be with other kind of living beings. So, I mean, we should talk about the nature of future, of the future nature. I mean, what it will look like. We won't have any more lions or this kind of animal lives, but we will have plenty of cockroaches. Should we learn to live with them? And what does it mean in the context of the Green Deal? I mean, it raises many issues. So, I mean, I'm not going into this very provocative line of thought, even though I work very much in this direction, but more than respect, I think we should fully learn what it means to be a natural being, you know, even within our bodies, you know, because we're going to be uh, sicker and sicker. I mean, uh, it's uh, affected with all kinds of uh, anthropocenic uh, diseases and it is part of our nature too. So, I mean, all this kind of question about nature uh, raises also questions. It's just provocative. Thank you, Natalie. I, I want to. I'll ask one more one more question myself. Sorry, to, the the things you guys are saying are are really really. I mean, are, are astounding and stimulating. I think for our discussion. So I will I will ask one more question myself, and then we try to open it up. Now we're getting some questions coming in on in the chat. All of you mentioned learning. Um, and and I, I mean, you mentioned it in, in slightly different contexts, of course. So I, I want to first pose a question to Fotini about, I mean, if, if you think about, you, you spoke about digital skills and you spoke about the importance of education in the digital transformation, adapting to working and living with new technologies. You talked also about disparities and inequalities uh, when it comes to education, when it comes to skills, when it comes to access as well. So I want to ask you, what kinds of digital gaps do you think are present and most pressing across the union? And are these regional? Are these national? Do they deal with access? Do they deal with infrastructure? Do they deal with skills? And, and how, can we, how can we address that in terms of the way we think about education? And then I want to ask a sort of the same question, not about digitalization, but I mean, Sarah and Natalie, both of you talked about learning in relation to, I mean, that the Green Deal is not just going to be about, you know, we're talking about something the next 30 years here, right? So it's not just about policy implementation, but also about learning and transforming the way we think about things. 
So I, I want to ask how, how you think education plays a role and, and what can be done concretely speaking in terms of curriculum development and knowledge exchange and sharing in this regard. But Fotini, please, I pass the screen to you first. Um, so I think, uh, thank you so much, Darian. So I think uh, definitely technology is at the, um, is, being, is developing so fast right now that people are not completely aware of how they can use it for their benefit, but also how they will be needed uh, to know how to use its technology in the future for their jobs or uh, how the, it's going to affect uh, the job market, as you said at the beginning in the introduction about how uh, automation is going to uh, make some of these jobs disappear. Uh, so we're thinking about uh, when we're talking about this digital transformation that the European Union is uh, moving forward, we're thinking about how we can make um, the policy development, the technology development and a citizen uh, awareness or citizen education work hand in hand in order to be to develop um, inclusive technologies, uh, inclusive policies. Uh, where we need to think about creating in inclusive uh, societies, right? Uh, so to make that happen, we need to work on all these three areas, on all these three fields together uh, at the same time and as they develop uh, from the beginning. Uh, so we shouldn't be thinking about allowing technology to grow. So I'm going back to growth. Um, to technology to grow uh, as fast as it has been growing in the past decade. Uh, without us having the control, let's say, of the ways in which people are aware of these technologies being developed and how they can use them or what, what negative impact might have on their lives. So give the, give, by, through education, give the right to people to um, maybe resist uh, the to technology that is being developed um, for in specific areas. I'm thinking about automation, I'm thinking about facial recognition systems that a European Union is pushing forward. Uh, but I'm also thinking, as I said earlier, about uh, groups and communities that exist on the margins. Uh, and when we're talking about technology, we're talking about senior uh, citizens, we're talking about people who live in, in rural areas and for which their lives are going to be changed uh, to their core because of the development of technology and their access to jobs, um, their access to civil services, uh, I would just say that, like how when we're digitalizing everything uh, in the governance, what, what, who are we leaving out? Who are we excluding from these discussions and from these um, developments that we are so much into developing right now and growing? Um, so education, educating people uh, at the same time as we are moving through this uh, this transformation is very important and significant to make this a successful transformation in my own perspective. Yeah, um, I would also like to add something on, on, uh, on the part of education. I think um, it would be malpractice uh, if our educational institutes would not take serious uh, that the new generations and the generations that are currently studying um, are basically also educated in sustainability science in so far, I, in my personal opinion, as it relates to what it is that they're studying. You can't have an economic student, in my opinion, who has never heard about uh, alternative uh, ways of having economics or uh, concepts such as degrowth. So I think it should go into the core curricula and of course it's up to everyone to decide how large and to what extent that should be included, but I think it should definitely be part of what we educate our students. We don't want to have, let's say, uh, an education that just uh, projects uh, what, whatever has been going on without showing clear alternatives so as to also adapt to the challenge challenges so that um, yeah, younger generations are capable of doing that because that's what we should be uh, educating for. And I, so I think that the SDGs and the United Nations, the UNESCO roadmap to 2030 on how to integrate, for instance, sustainable development goals into curricula all over the world, starting from primary school to uh, university and postgraduate even, I think uh, uh, we should definitely make use of the tools that are currently 
actively being made to do those sorts of things. Thank you. Natalie, do you want to add something to this? Yes, I, I, I'm being, I mean, learning is quite important, especially because uh, as I saw in the French uh, uh, climate convention, uh, most people were surprised and were learning about the climate emergency. I mean, I was myself very surprised of the, that fact because I am in this field since 20 years now. So I thought that everybody was aware of this emergency, but I saw that it was not the case because most people at least were invited to this convention thought that uh, it was the, the climate emergency was well, concerning China or United States, but not Europe. So I think we still have to, to, to teach a lot about how Europe is primarily concerned by uh, the emission to production of uh, uh, gas emission, but also consumption, you know. It is both of that side that we have to teach everybody uh, so I, I think there are a lot of issues uh, that are, are, are not taught in primary school, in small schools, and some students can have access to this learning, but most students at the primary levels do not have access to all this, uh, those, to all these uh, reflections. So I think there is still a very ambitious program to be to be done about that. Thank you. Let's, I want to now try to open it up to the to our to our audience for questions. I'm gonna I'm gonna apologize because I'm gonna go rogue and do exactly what I said we shouldn't do, which is actually <laughs> <laughs> allow people to speak. Um, um, and I, I think it would be a very nice. So we have a lot of questions suddenly coming in. A lot of questions about degrowth, um, and I apologize to all the degrowth questions. Uh, they're being gathered, and I think we can discuss those in the in the breakout sessions as well. But there is a question from. Now I'm going to put someone on the spot. So if you don't want to answer, just say, Darian, you read the question. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. There is a question, a really important one, about agriculture, and we didn't discuss agriculture. And I know the relationship between the Green Deal and the CAP is a really big sticking point and a really big issue. Um, so Francesca Colli, I invite you, if you would like, to to speak. Um, and to, to read, to tell us your question uh, and to, to pose it to the panelists. Sure, thank you for giving me uh, the floor. I'm just going to read my question. So basically, we know that the EU is struggling with the, the link between climate change and agriculture. So not just the need to shift away from livestock farming and reduce meat consumption, uh, but also the fact that regions that currently are high agricultural producers will probably shift due to climate change. Uh, so how can we reconcile what we've been speaking about with the need for just transition and, and kind of social justice with these sorts of agricultural shifts, which will really severely affect employment in these sorts of regions? Well, this is a very difficult question because the common agricultural policy uh, why strongly contributing to global warming, I mean, is not, uh, should be a key action in delivering the European Green Deal, but the fact that the uh, CAP reform doesn't stand up to the Green Deal promises right now. I mean, we have still to see how this reform will be up to the Green Deal. I mean, uh, so I don't know how. But I, I feel that in France, there is a strong demand, uh, especially from youngsters, from young people, to have, uh, I mean, just to settle in on the countryside and do some new kind of agriculture. But we don't have, uh, I mean, the land is, uh, uh, the, the ownership of the land is not tailored up to these uh, new ways of seeing agriculture. So it's not just a shift in terms of agriculture, it's also a shift in terms of ownership. Uh, it means a lot in terms of land use and everything like that. 
Do either of the other panelists want to want to add to Natalie's answer there, response? No? In which case, I'm going to call upon Elisaveta. Are you there? Do we see you, Elisaveta? To, you've put a nice question in, in the chat, and maybe it's even nicer if you get to, you get to say it out loud. Thanks, uh, Darian. Yes, indeed. So uh, I, I thought uh, I was provoked this morning by Alberto, who said uh, this is like a deja vu with the White Book of Governance. My personal deja vu is with the Lisbon Agenda, which was set in 2000 and was aiming for sustainable economic growth, uh, social cohesion, knowledge-based economy. And well, my PhD happened to be on that topic and on the implementation of it. And what we saw very much seconding uh, Seren's uh, point is that slowly we saw sustainability going out of the agenda, then social and social policies went out of this agenda. What was left was economic growth. So I'm very much sharing, I think, the pessimism that this is going to be a kind of a recycled version of the same exercise and therefore, and that's my real question. I want to ask, are there any governance um, innovations previewed to support the Green Deal? Because, and Darian, you'll be surprised, but learning was the main method by which it was hoped the Lisbon agenda will be achieved because member states will be learning from each other, sharing good practices, finding out good ways by which they can uh, stimulate these objectives and, and unleash this uh, potential. And well, some normative changes do, did take place, but on the whole, we are setting the same objective 20 years later. So this attests mm -hmm. to some extent how far we, we've reached with this governance mechanism. So the question is, are there any new governance mechanisms previewed? My personal observation is that there is much more reliance this time on carrots, meaning funds for just transition and uh, related to COP, I guess this can you know, stimulate to some extent this formula of uh, uh, money against reforms. Do you see any potential there? Do you see any uh, promising um, new implementation support mechanisms uh, on the horizon? Thanks a lot. So, um, I, yes, uh, I would be happy to start out. Yes, well, thank you for your question. And I think it's a very, Good observation indeed. Um, sometimes it seems that we're running in cycles and um, yeah, the question comes, have we learned anything or not? I think, um, uh, you know, I teach in my daily life also uh, the course on governance for sustainable development. And um, uh, one of basically the tenets of governance is that you have representation of often industry and market players, governments and civil society. And I think what we can see in the current plans is that uh, there's a heavy focus on the needs and the desires of uh, the industry and governments. So I think where we can really sort of uh, make the transition that I think many of us want uh, is a focus, a stronger focus on NGOs and movements, social movements. And I think we have gotten to this point even this quite ambitious agenda I would say even though of course we can uh, uh, we have criticism on that as well uh, from various uh, uh, parties but nonetheless I think it's very ambitious and I think it's there because of social movements and the voice of NGOs and I think if we don't want to run into um, in, in 30 years, ah, oh, well, in 2050, are oh, we failed again? And what are we going to do now? I think uh, to prohibit that from happening, I think we really need to look at mechanisms that include um, the participation of, of citizens. And I know that in this morning's session, this was also touched upon on how to do that. I'm afraid I also don't always have the answers to these things. But what I do know is that um, at the moment, uh, the European Union is, I mean, they have put this plan forward and now it's also about testing the waters. How is it going to be received by all the various parties? How are governments? How is the industry? And I would say, how are we going to react as citizens, as civil society? And I think we should not let that opportunity slide. Um, and we need to be, um, um, involving everyone in this conversation and that our voices be heard, the ones that we think are valuable. And I think if we go in that direction, we will have the most chance. 
I think very much along the same lines. I, I've been studying NGOs uh, since some times in, in uh, empowering uh, NGOs and civil society on climate change at different scales and levels and working with public policies also and taking into account justice issues at different scales and levels. And I think there is a, a, a resource that need to be tapped on, tapped on, I think this is the right word. I mean, uh, because most people do consider NGOs and civil society as uh, being freely engaged in this matter. I mean, have not always, uh, not, not having always private interest in climate change and such, while uh, police, pol uh, po uh, politics are strongly uh, deconsidered in France, especially. I mean, uh, so it's, I mean, we need to find new ways to rely upon civil society and stay with them until the end. And there are a lot of initiatives at local levels, very beneficial initiatives. And we need to look at them, see how beneficial they are, how to work with them, and to make them grow too in a kind of a network of initiatives at the European level, I think. Fotini, I'd like to ask you, I mean, a similar question. So the role of other societal actors has been has been mentioned here in relation to the to environmental policy and to the to the Green Deal, especially NGOs, um, as well as the involvement of what gets called you know, the societal partners in a broader in a broader scale. So not just industry and governments, but also representatives of, of labor. I mean, there's the same what well, how do you how do you think about this in relation to the digital transformation? I mean, who are the most important let's say, actors and, and partners that need to be involved to try to ensure a just digital transition. Um, thank you. Yes, uh, a very important uh, question. And I think um, the European Union has learned from their past mistakes, at least at this stage. Um, and they have been thinking about how they can include uh, NGOs or um, small, small and medium-sized enterprises in the decisions that they have been uh, taking or the policies that they have been developing when it comes to digital transformation. So in the past, if we were thinking about, if we were thinking about the 20 years ago, uh, the first people that the EU went to uh, discuss and like uh, get feedback from uh, was the big tech giants. Uh, we're thinking about Amazon, Google, uh, people who actually knew about the digital and who were developing it. And now we're thinking, we are seeing the EU going into actually uh, advise, being advised and advising uh, small and medium-sized enter enterprises and creating this kind of a bit more equal environment in, in of uh, what they call a data economy. Um, or the digital economy. Um, they're always very fast with uh, defining these really, really catchy uh, ideas, um, but they are thinking about them um, in order to uh, include them in, as in, a, in this vital part of the industrial fabric, which technology is going to change. And thinking about the technologies, thinking about the SMEs, the skills, and having the clear vision of uh, co-creating and co collaborating with these uh, smaller social uh, actors um, in the society. So um, I think to connect this back to the discussion that uh, and the question, the previous question, I think. Um, the digital strategy of uh, the Europe right now um, aims to set up a, a European data space, a, a single market for data, let's say, that they are planning to unlock unused data, they're planning to allow a flow uh, of freely, date, freely available data for all the European Union for the benefit of uh, all of these kind of smaller and uh, smaller enterprises. Uh, smaller companies, citizens as well, that want to develop new NGOs or new enterprises that want to tap into these um, data that are now uh, being going to become available. Um, 
so yeah, I'm thinking about. Uh, I, I I truly I kind of believe that the the this new if this goes ahead in in this form, uh, which brings together like businesses, uh, it brings together researchers, public administrators, uh, it brings together small and medium sized enterprises. This can be a more kind of a successful approach to this transformation that we've been talking about. Thanks so much. Thanks to, to all three of you. Um, I'm going to ask you guys to, to stick with us a, a little bit longer. Um, I think we're having a, a good conversation and I, I don't I want to give so I know I said that there's a there's a whole discussion going on in the chat and I want to try to bring that discussion a little bit into a, into our whatever we voice discussion however we however we talk about things is our out loud talk however we talk about things now um, and then we'll see how far we get and then we can also take that into the into the breakout sessions and uh, Dora you posed the first question I think in the chat if you don't mind me if you don't mind me uh, calling you out about degrowth um, do you want to just do you want to state your question you want to okay. uh, Sure, and thank you. I can just uh, read it out as well. So, as uh, the the concept of, of degrowth has been mentioned earlier, and it's a rather ambivalent concept even in debates, uh, my question was: To what extent can economic growth, uh, economic growth as associated with capitalism, be compatible with sustainable development, and how can degrowth help succeed? that, so the sustainable development, especially while the SDGs, so the sustainable development goals themselves, are conflicting in, in some cases, for instance, SDG 8 versus economic growth in a 2030 agenda that wants to succeed at full sustainable development with zero waste, for instance, by 2030. So how realistic is the downscaling of production and consumption, consumption that degrowth foresees while the population uh, rates are just constantly increasing globally and not just in the European Union. Thank you. Thank you. Someone on the panel wants to wants to pick that question up or if you say it's too big, we leave it for the breakouts. It's Well, it's a million dollar question. It might be a bit big indeed, but let me just um, just my two cents for now. Um, I think I think they're very uh, difficult to combine in many ways because uh, our whole financial system is of course based on growth. Um, so, there, so there really needs to be made alterations on so many levels and it's a very complex system of uh, the financial system is very complex. So I think in order uh, to do that, um, yeah, you would really need to also change I think uh, the outlook that we have on uh, what a successful lifestyle means. Um, so I think uh, the way we govern our lives needs to, we need to critically look at um, how, we, how we organize our lives and what we think is a good life in general. Um, and it's, a, it's an enormous task. And I don't know whether all these SDGs uh, can be compatible at all times. And I think I really liked this question somewhere in the chat as well that said something about um, how can you, I think it has to do with um, people who are living in poverty. How can we ask them to make these changes uh, as well? And I, and I think uh, we need to be extremely sensitive of this. Um, in who are in, in who we are asking to make which sacrifices at what point. So I think I will leave it at that for now. I was I was thinking about commoning. I mean, I think that the digital age has something to do with the capacity to share new goals at different scales. I, I go back to territories because I think it is a way to manage the transition to new ways of living, I mean, and sharing. I was very struck by the fact that people sharing the same goal, for example, in the Citizen Convention for Climate, I mean, sharing this goal of trying to find new solution to this climate issue, I mean, did, did deal a lot with collective intelligence and we're very satisfied with the fact of doing so. I mean, there is something to be tapped upon there. I mean, 
just to set the scene in order for citizens to work together at different scale with this kind of issue at stake. Okay, I'm gonna, if the organizers allow, I'm gonna bring this panel to a close. We Five minutes, five minutes before anticipated. We still have some great questions that I think we can take uh, onto the breakout sessions. Um, and I wanna really thank all three of you for just an outstanding panel, outstanding discussion. I'm kind of left a bit flabbergasted at the number of, of, of issues and questions that, that got raised in the depth of the discussion. So really thank you, thank you enormously. Um, and we really hope to see more of all of you um, in the events and activities that we organize as part of the continuation of this project. So I, I can I clap out loud for you guys. Everyone else will clap silently. Um, I hope to see you in the in the breakout sessions. Uh, now we have a, a coffee break, um, and in the in the final session as well. But thanks again, and thanks also. Sorry, I keep talking and talking. Thanks also to the fantastic questions that came from the audience as well. Really, really super, super. So much to discuss. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Darian. Thank you very much for the. Um, panel and we will now have again a coffee break um, and then we will come back at three o'clock and we will go into our breakout groups um, on democracy and, and social fairness etc and also look into the issues of uh, that were just raised and also into the issues that were raised uh, before lunch just a logistical issue so the uh, breakout groups will be chaired by different people some of them have already spoken today, uh, some of um, them haven't. So the first panel on social fairness and democracy will be chaired by Ian Cooper. The second breakout group uh, on EU values and global leadership will be chaired by Christian Surubaru, who is a postdoctoral researcher in European studies in Maastricht working on Europe. And the third panel will be chaired by the colleague of Serri who has already been referred to, uh, Pim Martens, he will chair the panel on the Green Deal and digital transformation. We had a lot of questions left for that panel. And Pim is a professor of sustainable development at our Mastery Sustainable uh, Development Institute. I got it a bit wrong, but almost along these lines. Okay, so uh, see you later at three o'clock and happy breakout. Thank you.